So this is our first pack of notes. Um, and like, we're gonna spend like just a, a while ch chatting about why we're here and what we intend to get from today. So this is kind of, this is just conversation stuff. So, where can I scroll? I'm difficulty scrolling through this, sorry. I'm going to, excuse me a second, everybody. I'm actually then going to just I'm having difficulty like going through my slides as I share my screen. So we're gonna look at it this way. So, um, why ggplot? Uh, um, this is our first kind of conversation. Uh, that's a slide about me, and um, Shannon is or Sharon is our um, co-pilot for today. So, thank you very much, Sharon. She's going to make sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, and I'd also like like to thank some people who are in, involved in getting this all together. All right then. Um, so. This kind of talk is going to geared at people. This uh, workshop is geared at people who have some experience of R um, and kind of they know their way around R. Essentially, kind of the the, the, the basic kind of uh, skill you need is to know what a data set is. Uh, so if you can have a concept of like some spreadsheet kind of thing, which becomes a data set, um, then you're kind of then you're good to go. Uh, it's talking through ggplot from the very beginning. So we're going to be making some some nice kind of graphics, some nice presentations. And um, it's for people who, uh, I guess, the ideal target audience is somebody who, who works with R, uh, who's heard about ggplot, um, seen what it can do, but hasn't quite kind of, uh, kind of taken the, 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 the their first steps into using it. So um, often there'll be somebody who, who works with R, maybe uses base graphics, uh, or even worse, might kind of take their work in R, take the results, and then like export them to like Excel or Tableau or something else, uh, and, and work with that. Um, so that's the kind of person where we're we're looking at today. Um, but if you do know ggplot, if you've worked with it before, um, you'll certainly get some benefit from, like, it's often good to, to, to hear things that you know already. So, so um, what ggplot is good for is this. Um, it's quite, it, it works kind of really well with the, with the fundamental kind of R structure. So it produces very nice graphics. Uh, it does so relatively easily. Uh, and it's very extensible. And if you if you think about the R structure, um, the R universe, we have your base R at the beginning, and um, from base R, the power of the of the whole platform is that uh, it can by installing packages we can make it very extensible. And then there are tens of thousands of packages available. That means that no matter what we're working with, it be healthcare or economics uh, uh, or medicine, there are always going to be things that we can use that'll, that other people have developed that we, that we can kind of plug into our own work. Uh, that's what makes R so powerful. And it means that one of the impact of that is if you've worked with R for a while is that you notice that there's uh, always several ways of doing exactly the same thing. So people, different people developing parallel packages, uh, which do kind of very similar things in slightly different ways. GGPod's almost unique in that, uh, well, pretty much unique in that it is uh, the really the only one that does graphic visualization the way it does. Uh, like if you look at tables, for example, there's umpteen packages that, that, that show tables. But when you want to show kind of graphs and figures, really it's just GGPod has dominated the marketplace. So it's kind of, it's very much the, it's a, it's a core focus of, uh, of R 
in the same way that perhaps only just maybe more on markdown might be. So it's kind of quite a, it's a very powerful tool, has a huge amount of development. Uh, and if you work with ggplot, um, you have tens of thousands of people on your side. So, so what, why we're not here is what the whole focus of today is to give you guys the, the toolbox of ggplot. So it's about the actual mechanics of being able to produce visualizations. What we're not going to do is talk about what kind of what those pictures might look like. In other words, we'll let you produce what you want to. Uh, we're not going to talk about design of, of good visualization. We're not going to talk about good practices. Uh, having said that's not our focus. Having said that, kind of whenever you make a picture, you know, it, it's, it'll be kind of a, a subtext in the background of, hey, this is this is a, a good thing to do, uh, and um, maybe steer away from that. And actually. GGplot is quite um, helpful in that it tends to guide you in the right direction. It tends to like prompt you to, to produce visualization, which is not just powerful, but also like nicely produced. So uh, then, uh, so with that in mind, uh, we've got to point out that graphics are very important. Uh, they, are, they are the most visual part of any kind of presentation you make. Uh, when you have graphics, the whole thing is that there should be a message inside in there. So uh, we produce them ourselves, but they are for our audience and they are like, they should have an impact. They should have like a, they should carry information and they should carry like we're saying, like a message. Uh, and uh, what we'll be doing kind of is we'll be starting from the get go of different, different types of ggplots. Uh, and then we'll kind of branch out into talking about uh, the different like, ways in which we can take a plot and then kind of give it our own kind of imprint and our own kind of a, uh, uh, our own way of looking at things. Uh, okay, so let's kind of compare for a second ggplot and the base. And these two graphs side by side, you see like the one on the left hand side there is produced with base graphics. And it's a histogram uh, of the, this is the uh, a data set from the NHR data sets, uh, length of stay uh, in hospitals and of different age of patients. And we can see right there, this one on the line of code will produce that nice little histogram. That's base graphics. On the other hand, ggplot line kind of produces the same thing, uh, pretty much. Uh, it's the same data, just in different bins, or like a, the, the actual pillars look a little, little, little bit different. Um, but now these two lines of code, it's a bit more kind of complicated. So in this case, uh, base is winning. Uh, base is easy to work with. Um, however, once you get to something moderately complicated, um, here we have a data set looking at uh, gene expression levels for um, uh, people treated with various uh, um, uh, various supplements. And we see that these little kind of nine little blocks right there, they are kind of looking at various genes kind of and how they express themselves uh, based on different supplements added. And the code on the left is the base code to produce that graphic. And it doesn't even fit in our page over here. It's kind of quite long and quite complicated. Uh, to get this done. So there's a lot of typing involved. Whereas the same graph in ggplot, this is like made to look as, as close as possible to the previous one. Uh, and actually like, it, it, they do kind of stack up very well side by side. You can see the ggplot code is far simpler. It's far shorter. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the amount of typing you've got to do, it's better. Uh, and that's kind of, that's a good thing because uh, as they say, like good coders are lazy coders uh, in that you want to have things as, as short as possible. Uh, there's less chance for making mistakes. And more than that, not just less typing, but less thinking. So the actual structure of ggplot means that it lends itself to producing this kind of plot without having to kind of turn through hoops and to manipulate things and to, to try different formula. It's got kind of the, it's got the, the, um, the structure you need kind of at your fingertips and makes it a lot easier to produce a graphic without having to, to, to like I say, to do too much thinking. Uh, so it, very quickly when you get to the graphics, ggplot kind of makes things easier. Uh, and it's worth the pain of kind of, of discovering ggplot and getting going on ggplot. Uh, it very quickly repays that by, by making our kind of our, our, our life more productive. Um, as we were saying, ggplot kind of tends to be a, it's a big player in the R world. Uh, it's one of our core packages. And this is a little control through, these are a whole bunch of packages on CRAN. And they all begin with gg. And that is the, 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 the hallmark of a, a ggplot package is it, it has starts with gg. Almost all of them do. Uh, so that's not 
universally true, but almost all of them do. And you can see there's an awful lot of them. Uh, so from the I think 40 odd thousand packages on CRAN, there are uh, the guts of a thousand which can deal directly and only with ggplot. Uh, you can see there's a bit of everything inside in here. Uh, I like there's ggpacman, uh, which produces plot, which has the pacman theme. There's ggsoccer, uh, somewhere inside in here, which lets you produce gggraphics, which has a soccer pitch in place. Um, and down across the board. So, and there's, there's some quite, uh, uh, there's ggbio, for example, uh, is for people working genomics. Uh, so some of them are quite kind of pointed for different areas, and some of them kind of are useful like right across the word. Right across the, the, the sphere of ggplot. So it, there's an awfully big world. And as you work with ggplot, you'll find that there's, you end up in, put, uh, discovering more and more packages that, uh, that are useful for uh, enhancing your graphics. Now, um, in addition, it should be pointed out that there are some, there's a lot of things which don't call themselves ggplots, but they really are. Um, so this shows a plot right here, um, both left and right. It's looking at kind of, uh, uh, it's, I can't actually read the text over here. Um, it's an unsupervised clustering of uh, some data uh, and picks out the principal components of that, that, that data. So this is like a machine learning kind of thing. And it, it's called FViz cluster, um, but uh, under the hood, it's a ggplot. And we can, we can see that by, we can take that and, and embellish that the way we'll be seeing later on today. Uh, with kind of ggplot uh, aspects to make it look whatever we, we, we want to. So it's, it doesn't call itself ggplot, but it really is. So that's kind of true for lots of things in, in, our, uh, in, the GG, in the R world. And so just to summarize, uh, ggplot is easy to make uh, and you can make it in some very good advanced graphics kind of quite, um, quite simply in ggplot. Um, it's very good at having not just one kind of graphic, but a whole sequence of them. So it's structured so that you can take a, you can make a fundamental ggplot and then by kind of massaging that, you can get a whole, have a whole sequence of graphics, which again, like they have a, they unfold the story uh, and uh, they let your data speak. And the last reason is that there's this whole tidyverse thing, which includes things like tidy R and tidy data and deplier R and forecasts and all kinds of stuff um, that are, uh, I guess uh, it's a whole philosophy with an R and the ggplot fits in nicely with that kind of particular domain. So it's kind of geared to, to, to plug in directly to this whole suite of other packages, which are part of the, the tidyverse. Um, so it kind of makes life useful that way. Um, before we're going to get stuck into the workshop proper, I'd like to kind of maybe kind of uh, uh, give you some background stuff. Uh, hopefully you'll walk away from today's work and say, yeah, I'd like to discover more. So let's kind of, this should give you kind of a flavor and a, like an impetus maybe to, to, to put ggplot into your working lives and to, uh, to push on from there. And there are some resources over here. So these are all books. Uh, most of them are online. Uh, some are physical copies. So the big book of R is a kind of compendium of pretty much everything. Uh, if you click on that link right there, it opens up kind of a, like a massive world of kind of, of um, of resources. Uh, it's almost overwhelming. There's so much stuff inside in there. Um, so I kind of picked out a few, which I find particularly nice. There's a book on graphics by Kieran Healy, uh, who's a social scientist. Um, and it's, it's online right there at that sockbiz.co link, but it's also, you can buy a physical copy if you'd like to. Uh, it's very good. And lots, kind of, lots of our work that you're looking at today kind of are, have been fed off, his, off that book. Uh, Hadley Wickens' book on data science. There is Hadley Wickens down there in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and he has a book on data science and a book on ggplot in particular. So he's the guy who wrote it in the first place. There's a book out by Klaus Wilkie. Uh, again, the, that link over there should open up the online version. Uh, but again, you can buy a physical, a physical copy. If, if like me, you kind of, uh, you like having something in your hands to, to, to when you're reading. Um, and it's also gonna work at there. There's a like book down is a, book down is an R markdown package where people can author books with an R. Uh, and bookdown.org has a large list of books which have been produced with that package. And there's not a lot of them. And they tend to be kind of, they tend to be about data science. Well, they are about data science, uh, but all different fields. And large numbers of them will, will be specifically about, about ggplot and how to work with ggplot. Uh, next up, some websites. 
um, Carl Broman, uh, who is again down there in the bottom right hand corner, uh, has uh, an online nice website. Uh, likewise, uh, Bradley Bumke, uh, um, Cedric Shearer, right there. These are all links to their websites. Um, and the R Graph Gallery kind of is, is, is work. This is like a just kind of showing it. These are plots, and this is the code that produced them. And that's kind of inspiring to look at other people's work and, and, and to feed off there. And then lastly, there's just stuff about graphics in general. Um, Rafael Erizari um, is right there in the bottom right hand corner. Um, I, he has a nice kind of like take on plots to avoid. So in other words, these are graphics that didn't quite work out and you should not do this. So it's kind of talking about good, good practice in graphics. Uh, it's also quite like it's, um, you look at the graphs in question and you kind of tell yourself, oh, yeah, I remember producing graph pretty much like that. There's, and then there's the other flip side of the coin, there's the, the really, really nice ones. Uh, and these links are where they will, will, will show them off. Um, uh, Laura Ellis is at Little Miss Data. Uh, it's a very nice kind of blog about um, her, her work and lots of that is in data visualizations. Uh, we'll spend some time this afternoon talking about colors and there's links to, 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 to colors in, in R um, right there. And actually when we talk about different kind of, uh, when we talk about colors, we'll also get linked to other resources, which tap into that area. And then uh, lastly, there's a, a talk this time last year uh, at the R Studio conference um, by uh, William Chase uh, about the glamour of graphics. Uh, so ggplot stands for the grammar of graphics. So you did a little kind of take on that. It's a, <clears throat> it's a 20 minute talk. It's very good. Um, and uh, we'll be kind of lifting, when we talk about fonts later on this afternoon, we'll be lifting some of the stuff. Uh, that's at the last year's conference from the R Studio. Uh, this year's conference starts this uh, later on this afternoon. So I think at four o'clock, um, the R conference, the uh, studio conference will, will, will start. Uh, it's online. You can register, you know, right now if you want to. Uh, it's, it's free. Uh, and it's a 24-hour marathon. So you can have as much R as you want to for the next, the next day or so. Um, that's something else I meant to say as well. Ah, but now I've forgotten. So that's uh, that's our trip through R. Uh, that's what we uh, hope to um, establish today. I'm kind of wondering at this point if you guys would like to maybe introduce yourselves. So uh, Sharon, would it be appropriate to ask people just to turn their camera uh, cameras on for a minute and maybe have like put a little kind of like a little kind of blurb in the in the in the chat line about just about themselves uh, so something like i'm gonna kick that off okay well so that's me uh, I'm not sure if you guys would like to, if you're just, if you're comfortable, like if you just like, like to say um, uh, who you are and uh, I don't know, like a, a couple of lines about yourselves. I'm not gonna say, if you'd like to turn your cameras on, that'd be kind of a, that'd be nice too. Would you like to go next, Sarah? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So Sarah, um, who's a retired surgeon. Um, welcome, Sarah. Harvey, um, are you there? You retired, but you haven't retired. That's that's nice. <laughs> no, I've, I've been wanting to work with data for years, and never had the time, and now I do. Excellent. How are you finding the transition? Oh, I'm loving it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, no stress. <laughs> Just pottering around with data. Yes. Uh, and where are you? Where are you based, Sarah? In Northumberland. Oh, cool! Just, Lovely. Just, just um, north of Newcastle. Lovely part of the world. Can we just use voice, or do you want me to type? Uh, you can talk. If you, you're, you're welcome to talk if you like it. Well, I'm Harvey. Um, Working in Public Health Wales, as as I guess many, some a few people here might do. Um, I'm an analyst. Um, I've got a cat. 
<laughs> and the cat's working with you as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to ask um, a question earlier, but you actually answered it in your introduction. So um, I guess just want to say thanks to Sharon for making this happen. Thanks, Eugene, for, for doing this in advance. And um, what's the format of, like, if we've got questions, should we, like, do the hands up thing within Zoom? Or do we just interrupt you? Or should we wait? How would you like to do this, Eugene? I'd, I'd like to be interrupted. Um, um, I mean, there, there's, it's a, it's a, we're a small enough like, group, so I think it's, it's just, uh, just jump in there. Great. Uh, and uh, even if kind of, if like it's something, hey, hang on a second, something five minutes ago that I, you know, want to talk about again, but don't be, uh, don't be shy about doing that. Um, Did you want people to put their hands up on the screen? If, if they're more comfortable doing that, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, so. and you might, you might kind of, you might keep an eye on that. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on that for you. Uh, Shall we plow on? Should we go? Okay. Uh, Gethin, thank you, Harvey and Sarah. Sarah, sorry. Hi, Gethin. Hello. My name's Gethin. I also work in Public Health Wales with Harvey. And yeah, similar to him, I'm also a data analyst. And I too have a cat, but she is somewhere else. <laughs> I'm, I'm spotting a theme here. Yes. Cats and data analysts go hand in yeah. hand. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gethin. Go, go on. Are you there? No? Shall we move to Mohammed? Mohammed, are you there? They're all having coffee. Possibly. They're wise. Okay. Carolina. All right, so they're feeding their cats. Oh, he, Mohammed is here. <laughs> is he in the chat? Oh, he sent the message directly to oh, me. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's here. That's fine. Okay, then. Um, Carolina. Oh, we, have a, we have a Python expert in our, in our team. That's nice. Possibly not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Shall we, shall we press on? Shall we can yeah. move on to our, 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 our course proper? Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. So moving down to our second pack of notes. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to make some plots right now for the first time today. Um, so we've broken this down uh, initially into different types of plots. So we've got proportions in our first pack and then our, our next pack, then after, after our coffee rate, we're going to have distributions and relationships. So proportions are um, basically how much everything, everything you have. Uh, we have um, nine people in our chat here. Uh, we have two or three women and two and, and, and um, six or seven guys. So again, that's a, that's a proportion. That, that's, that's the number of each person, number of each gender kind of on our chat. Uh, so that's what, it, that's what we mean by proportions. Now, so we'll be talking about that in this chat, in this block. Before we get going on that, let's talk about ggplot and it's, it's kind of its basic structure. So with ggplot, you can think of it as every kind of, you, you build it up piece by piece. So if you remember our, uh, the line of code we had in, in, in the last section to make our histogram, it became in lines. And each kind of line, each line delivers kind of an extra element of our plot. And we're going to break, that, break them down into three different things. The first are aesthetics. So this is, if you have a data frame, every row of that data frame will tell you about one kind of one individual. Um, you have a person, what their gender is, what their age is. Uh, where they live, uh, what their what their weight and height is, that kind of stuff. So every row across our data set will tell you about that individual. And aesthetics are part of your plot, which is different for everybody. So it depends on what the content of those rows. So if you want to plot, uh, you want to have a plot, for example, of um, somebody's age against their against their weight. Okay, if you're plotting that, then 
everybody's point will, will, will land in a different, different area because everybody's values are different. That makes an aesthetic. So it depends on the content of your data set. An attribute is the same for everybody. So if you wanna, for example, adjust the size of a point on a graph, or if you wanna have a, uh, if you want to have a label with a different type of font, these are all attributes because they'll be, they won't depend on the content of the row. They won't depend on individuals uh, in our data set. They'll be the same for everybody. And then lastly, layers. So when we build up a plot, uh, we have to feed in our data set. We have to set out some aesthetics and some attributes, but then we put layers on top of that. So we'll look at that in just a second, but we'll see that the layers, what they do is they decide what should be on the axis. They decide uh, what kind of thing we, we want to put lines or points or um, how we want to, to, to distribute things. And they'll also determine things like uh, what color scheme we should use, what fonts we should use, uh, the overall layout of our plot. So um, what happens is we make our ggplot piece by piece. We build it up and every kind of line of our code will be can, will deliver an aesthetic, an attribute or a layer. So let's, you guys um, should have a little screen opening popping up right now. Uh, let me know if you don't. Uh, we should have some exercise to do. Doesn't look like, is it to say you need to reload that link on your end? Yeah, it's not working for me. It's working for you guys. Oh, if I go on the website, one sec. It's not working for me either. It's saying disconnected from server. Oh, actually, if you think reload it. Any joy, anybody? I think maybe it's got, I can see some, some code in a small box. Palmer penguins, is it that? That's, let me look at, no, that's not it. Um, Give me one second, I'm gonna pull it up. I'm gonna show you what it should look like. Okay. Is it a quiz? It's a quiz. Yeah, okay. It's working on mine. Phew because there'll be quite a few of these today. So this is... Um... Oh, I think I might have it one second. Yeah, I think I got it. Excellent. So I'll ask you kind of to it give you some examples and ask you to figure out um, should they be uh, aesthetics or layers or attributes. You've made this all yourself, haven't you, Eugene? Yeah, is it this is using the learner package and it lets you embed kind of, um, well, the whole set of slides are doing with sharing and, and it lets you kind of embed kind of shiny apps. I was right. I want to work on our shiny at some point. So interesting. Should we, should we proceed with the quiz? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, please do. So, uh, yeah, so what you, what you get to see is this. If you're asked, you've got a data set of stroke patients, um, you're told their ID, their age, their length of hospital stay, which is like the, one of the NHR data sets. And you're asked for those kind of uh, six different things, which one of them are aesthetics? So you remember kind of our, our, our benchmark was aesthetics were uh, something which affects every point differently. So if you want to work through that, click them out and then submit your answer and we'll tell you with your right here. It'll kind of give you some feedback about how you got on. So if we do the first three, yeah, not good. Oh, I see. Nah. Okay, so that was the first quiz. Now, let's look at this 
intern everybody. They're gonna, we're gonna build up a ggplot from, from the ground. So we begin with a data set. Uh, here we have Palmer Penguins, which is like a lovely data set to work with. This is kind of, it's a nice way to introduce kind of a, a graphing. So what you have is you got a data set about these penguins in the, in the um, South Atlantic. It gives you their species. Uh, we just see they're all at Adelaide penguins at the beginning, but actually there are three different species. Uh, again, uh, Torgensen is, is the island for the first one, but there are other islands as well. And for each penguin, it tells you it'll measure their uh, different characteristics, um, their bill length and depth, their flipper length, their body mass, and also their, it'll tell you their gender. So that's our data set. Now, we then call it ggplot. And what that does is it kind of, it, it sets up a blank canvas. So like okay, now we, everything, the stuff on the right has disappeared. That's ggplot. Next up, we call our first aesthetic. So the way we do this is uh, AES stands for aesthetic. Uh, and um, this is like, by the way, this is, uh, this is the long way to do this. This is called slow ggplot, where we do everything step by step, very slowly. Uh, in future, we'll, when we do plots, we're going to be combining different commands and, and make it more streamlined. But let's do it like the, the long way first of all. So this aesthetic sets up the x-axis and says that the x-axis should be body mass. So we can see over here, it's now drawn to the bottom of our screen. It's put in place uh, an x-axis. And it's also gone to our data and figured out what the range should be. So it says it's 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. That means that our penguins are between three and six kilos. These are small penguins. Next step, what comes out of the x-axis? The y-axis. And we chose this case, in this case, to plot bill length. Uh, and again, it's an aesthetic and it goes on our y-axis. And again, it figures out that bills are between 40 and 60 uh, millimeters in length. Step number three, let's put our points in place. So all of a sudden now we have for every, each of these the dots will represent a penguin uh, and they'll have, uh, here's a really big one with a long bill and a, a heavy mass. And they tend to be kind of the, 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 the bigger you are, the longer your bill is. Uh, so we see all our points and now like these guys, we have like 150 odd penguins and each one gets a dot here. Um, again, that's a layer kind of, so we're taking our aesthetics and we're making a layer with that. <coughs> Within that layer, we said point size equals three. So that is a, that command right there is a attribute. All points are the same size. It doesn't depend on what penguin you are. You get a point size of three. Next up, our third aesthetic, color. Uh, and that'll depend on the species. So we have, uh, we'll see in a second, we have Adelaide chin strap and Gentoo penguins and they all get a different color. Uh, so you can see that there's a, they separate out quite nicely. Uh, there's some overlap, but there are different species have different kind of uh, areas on this graph. <clears throat> now, <coughs> going back a second, the default colors for ggplot aren't very good. Um, so here we have uh, red, green, and blue. <coughs> for one thing, they're not very penguiny. Uh, they don't kind of they don't say Antarctic to me, uh, and also they're they're a poor choice of colors from a be able to distinguish them. I mean, you think red, green, and blue are quite separate from each other, but actually this red, green, and blue, they all have the same intensity. They have different spectral qualities, but they're not brighter or they're more like, they're not more or less intense from each other. So they're better ways of distinguishing colors uh, than ones we've chosen right there. So that's what we do next up. We have a scale color manual whereby we, uh, we change our color scheme. Uh, and that is another layer. Next up we're having a little, <coughs> we're adding a layer whereby we kind of outline our data points. So we could, so we saw our different penguin types went to different parts of our plot. So to highlight that, we kind of print little bags around each one. And again, there's, that is a layer and it has an attribute of size equals five, which tells you about how thick those lines are. Now, then we add some labels to this. We add some text on our graph and the labs kind of command, the labs kind of layer uh, take care of that for us. And we have a title, which is up here, length versus body mass. We have a subtitle below that, right there. Uh, and then we have change, like if, if you remember, our, our y-axis, for example, was bill underscore length underscore millimeter, which was the name of the column on the data table. But we can do better. So we can change that to being bill length brackets millimeters, a more kind of formal way of representing it. And we've given some kind of a 
credit there at the bottom right hand corner, we've had a caption, which you just see at the bottom right hand corner of our graph. Their data comes from Palmer Penguins. The subtitle is you can see over there, you might recognize that uh, span style, cutter, black, Adeline, so on. You might recognize that as being HTML. So that's kind of going to sit there as HTML for the moment. We'll soon change that. Now, um, <clears throat> the defaults for ggplot are pretty poor. So if you make your basic ggplot uh, uh, graphic, yeah, it's not that well presented. And this kind of gray background over here, for example, that's quite annoying. So we're going to get rid of that by having what's called theme minimal. So that gray background has disappeared. Um, and then we're going to change our other elements of our, uh, our graphic. We're going to have bigger text. So again, our default for ggplot makes every all the writing very small. That's not very good. So we've made it bigger. And we also changed the font. So we made it kind of stand out more by having kind of a like a crimson kind of red. And we've changed the changed the font from being kind of quite a dull kind of uh, looks like um, Arial font to something which is making it more familiar. And then, oops. And then uh, this next line, this next layer, <coughs> takes care of the the. Um, the mark then text because we wanted to have different color for the Adelie, Chinstrap, and Gen 2 penguins. So the Adelie are the smaller ones in black. Chinstraps have, uh, are quite small, but they have long bills. And then the Gen 2 penguins are the largest ones. So we'd be able to then identify the penguin species based on the color of our text in our, in our um, subtitle. And lastly, as we saw in our data frame, uh, penguins come in two sexes, male and female, and here we separate them out. So again, that's another layer. So you can see we build up our plot by a series of adding attributes and aesthetics and layers from a data frame to having to having a picture. Okay, that's how ggplot works. So it's very constructive that way. Okay. So we're gonna then that's gonna set the, the, the playing field for how ggplot works. Uh, then let's look at ways in which we can uh, picture our data in ggplot. And again, there's a link to our website here, the top 50 visualizations in R, which talk about the different ways of examining data. Um, we're going to talk here about amounts um, and proportions. That's this pack of notes. Uh, our next pack of notes, then, which we'll have after coffee, will be distribution and relationships uh, in red. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones that we, you know, maybe for another workshop, uh, time series groups, networks, and, and spatial data. So amounts. What amounts are is how much of stuff you have. Like we're saying kind of a, like in this group, you have nine people and they, you know, you, you might have say, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, six women and, and, and three guys, that's an amount, okay? And we're gonna look at that in three different ways, bar plots, dot plots, and lollipop plots. So let's take our, our diamonds data set. And here we have uh, this diamonds data set has several thousand diamonds. Uh, for each one, it tells you how big they are, which is a carrot, 0 0.31, 0 0.23, and so on. It tells you how good they are, idea of premium good, very good, fair. Okay, that's a, that's a measurement of quality. And it tells you about their color, their clarity, their, their depth, and so on uh, across our data frame. And then X, Y, and Z refer to the specifics of their shape. That's a diamonds data set. Okay. Now we're going to take our we're going to take that and make a ggplot. So again, we have to launch ggplot. We have the ggplot command. Uh, this little thing over here, I should mention, that's called a pipe. So it says the way this works is this is part of the, the tidyverse framework. So what this says is that little kind of db above percentage sign, arrow, then percentage sign, that takes the data set and feeds it into ggplot. So it is, uh, it's, if you want, you can say that that's di diamonds and then ggplot. Uh, so it kind of takes it and, and pops it in. Uh, we set up an aesthetic within our ggplot command, which is cut, and that goes along the uh, x-axis. So we have our different kind of categories of diamond, good, fair, very good, premium, and so on. They get placed along the x-axis. So when we call that, it's, it's gone to our data set it's figured out what different types of diamonds we have, 
and put them a place along our x-axis. Now, then we have a layer and there, to draw a, um, uh, a bar chart like this, there are two different ways of drawing the layer. This one's called geom bar. Uh, and what it's done is make this put in place these layers right there. It's given a firebreak four as the fill. So that is all of them, all of our bars will be the same color. Firebreak four is a color. Uh, and because these are solid colors rather than outlines, we call it fill rather than color. And alpha 0.6 means they're a little bit translucent. So they're not kind of a, you can kind of almost see through them. They're a bit kind of faded out. That's what alpha does. It, it, it uh, changes the opacity. Now, June Bar has, unbeknownst to us, done a lot of work to produce this. So it's got to go through our data frame. It's got to say, okay, hang on. Right. I know we have lots of fair diamonds inside in here, but how many? So it's got to go to our data frame and count each of every one. So it trolls through all several thousand diamonds, does a count of each one. It then looks at the maximum number and sets up an axis. So, so like it, there's a range of our axis that's chosen as well based on these results. So GM bar, that process has done a lot of work to produce the figure you see right there now. Okay. And then uh, we add another layer on of our caption. So you can see right there at the bottom right hand corner, we get this uh, data comes from the tidyverse. Okay, so that's, a, that's gonna, that's a bar chart uh, <coughs> as produced with GM bar. And it does, you work with GM bar whenever we have a data set where we have to count things out. Uh, now, next example. Uh, taking the same data set again, GM cut. Uh, we're going to fill them. This time there's no alpha. So you can see there's a different color over here because we don't have any transparency. The more, uh, the more intense. Okay, we put a title inside in here. Again, this is a new layer. Uh, again, we put our caption at the bottom, uh, data tight errors, we had that before. But now we do a coordinate flip. So this is a nice way of presenting things because uh, this text along the bottom, for example, if you look at very good, uh, very good, it's kind of, it's, it's quite long. Um, it sits better, especially when you have longer titles to have them kind of, to have them going horizontally. <coughs> so a coordinate flip does that for us. All right. And then, You'll notice right here, if you look at the bottom layer, we have zero, 5,000, 10,000. We don't really care how many kind of, of each diamond we have. What we really care about is the proportion of each one. So we want to know that there's more ideals and premiums and so on down the list. Uh, the actual numbers are superfluous. And one of our, one of our guiding points for uh, good visualizations is to have as little text as possible. So in other words, uh, to economize our ink. So if it doesn't carry a message, it shouldn't be there. <coughs> so those numbers along the bottom, along the x-axis, eh, they're not important to us, let's get rid of them. And the way we do that is, again, we'll talk about themes this afternoon. The x-axis text was these numbers along the bottom and we set them to be element blank means that they are, they are disappeared. And what do we do here? And again, if you look, we have the word count here is at the bottom, but again, he's no longer necessary because we've got rid of our numbers. So he is also set to be not the blank. And there's our figure. Uh, oh yeah, and last thing, another kind of layer. We set the, type, the, 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 the title to have a different kind of font like that. So it's given the, a bold font. <coughs> So you get the kind of picture of how we kind of work out our g how it's done by, by step by step and how we like how we describe different things. Different elements of our data frame are given to, 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 to change individual kind of uh, elements of our, our, our set, how they can be global ones with attributes and then how we can build it up with our layers. Right then, these are movies. Uh, this is different now. This is like, that was geo and bar. We're now gonna see a different way of producing bar charts. <clears throat> because in this, we just have in our previous data set with our diamonds, we had 54,000 different diamonds. So we had to count. In this one, our next one, 
with our movies, we just have 10. We just have 10 rows in our data set. And we have, uh, these are movies from a week or so ago. And it has their box office receipts. So the top one is The Crudes, and then Monster Hunter, then Use of the World, go down that over here. Uh, because the titles can be quite long, we've used abbreviations to change their, to, to shorten them. So you can see TCA and A, you can recognize it being The Crudes and you, and you, uh, and you age. Uh, what else is there? Let's see. So this is Pinocchio, and this is Fatal, and so on down the list. So if you know movies, you'll be able to recognize the, the, the title from that little abbreviation. Uh, and for each movie, we have a how much they grossed in the box office. So this is what we care about. We want to have a, a bar chart where we have a movie and how much it grossed. So we take our movies and we're going to put the. Now we need to have two aesthetics, an X and a Y. So the movie goes along the x-axis and the gross figure goes along the y-axis. So we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to specify with, with Jill and Barr. We did not have to specify count. It was done for us. Uh, for this case, we do have to specify what we want to go along our y-axis. And then we put that in place. We put these a Jill and call now. So Jill and Barr, we use when we have to do the counting process. Geom call is when we already have the number, we already have something which specifies how hard these, these bars are going to be. So it's a different kind of process. And again, we're going to go to color and Firebook 4 being our favorite color these days. And we're going to change our scales. Yeah, this is quite nice. <coughs> so, <Can> you, <coughs> yeah. Can I just ask how, how can we tell if what you say if, if we know the the height of the x-axis, of the y-axis there, that yeah. can help us determine whether we're using geom bar or geom call. Yes. Could you just clarify that a bit, please? Yeah, good question. <coughs> so we use geom bar whenever we have to, when you've got a very large data set, 54,000, and when you have to count different entries in each one. So our data set didn't, nowhere in the data set did it say that we had like 25,000 ideal diamonds. We had to figure that out. We had to do right. accounting. <clears throat> Whereas if we look at geom call, if we go back to our data set, so the height of our bar over here, for example, take the, the cruise, it goes up to just north of $150,000. Uh, All right. So in the previous example, we were counting the 50,000 records. Yes. Whereas here, yeah, yeah. given the 161 is their inner data set already. We have the value. You don't have to figure column. it out. Okay. Thank you. So That's really helpful. call is lazier. Yeah, great. <coughs> so we have our bars. Um, yeah, so if you look at our receipts, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, they're in dollars. So here, they're just a number, 150. We want to have the dollar sign in place. So that's what scales does for us. So the label dollar uh, number from, from, from scale, that kind of gives us those dollars. Like a nice little feature you can put in place. You don't need that kind of thing, but it's got a nice little feature to have. Uh, and then we put our, our, our text in place, our box office receipts, uh, our gross amount, and these are in thousands of dollars. Uh, and we have a subtitle there. This comes from Box Office Mojo. Uh, and then we did our, our usual thing, like looking at it like this, it's going to be kind of clunky. When it's on its side, it's it's far more appealing. And kind of bar charts just tend to look better on their side, especially when you have long long captions. And then, okay, that's that's what we did right there. And then our next example is using Gapminder is a very useful data set. And what we have over here is we got our five continents, and we have the life expectancy in each continent over. Uh, in 2007. So what do you think? Is it going to be a geom bar or a geom call? Why don't you think, think about that for a second? Remember, geom bar it has to do counting. Geom call, we know how big our bar is going to be right from the get-go. So geom call? Geom call it is. Yes. So there she is uh, at the bottom, geom call right there. Uh, we put our bars in place. Um, again, because we have geom call, we need to specify two things. So in our data set, if you look at it, 
we need to say what goes in the x-axis if we want to look at the confidence and what should dictate the height of the bars. We have to tell, we can tell our system where to find that information. That's why it has to have two aesthetics, content and life expectancy. <coughs> right there. And you get the kind of little bar chart. Looking at this from a from a from a design perspective, um, there are some things here which need to be discussed. First of all, you know that Africa and Asia and Europe are continents. We don't need that label right there. That's superfluous. And because it's not needed, it shouldn't be there. Um, next up, these bars, they're very thick and clunky. Again, that's a lot of ink. And our general rule of thumb is like less ink is better. So to economize like how much stuff we put on the page, um, that's a good, not a good approach. <clears throat> so is there better ways? Again, take our same data set, our same set of numbers. We could just point, we could just pop points. And would that work? Well, again, we kind of look at Oceania across over here, Europe there. Eh, it's kind of hard to match up a continent with the dot in question. So again, that's, that's not so great for us. Um, and a better way is this. This is called a lollipop chart. And it's kind of quite nice is that we have a lollipops going across like this. And we can find quite easily that Asia corresponds to that dot right there. And one more thing we have done is we have ordered these things. So in the previous one, these dots were kind of basically following an alphabetic order. Africa, the Americas, Asia, it's alphabetical. And that's kind of, that's what R does by default. It wants to find an order and it does so um, by the alphabet. In this one, we have actually told it with that little thing over here, with factor reorder, we have told it that it must kind of put the longest figures on the top. So again, that's, that's good practice for visualizations to have it that way. Um, okay. So the summary of our man, our romance. So we have a, as we're saying, kind of we're presenting how much of everything we have. Geom bar does account, okay, and does processing for us. Geom call is when we kind of know what the quantities are already. Uh, and then lollipops are nice. Uh, and lollipops basically are produced. It's a bit of a fudge. There should be a, a GG lollipop package, but there isn't. Uh, then we have to put the point in place, first of all, with that layer right there. And then we have to supplement that with a line going across called geom segment. And geom segment takes care of the line going across. And you gotta tell that they all begin at zero and the end, uh, well, sorry, they're all kind of, do you remember we flipped our, we flipped our coordinates over here. So this is the X's and these are the Y's. So the, uh, each line stays on its continent, goes straight across from its continent. So therefore X beginning and ending is at the same level. And then the Y's go from zero, which is right there to the life expectancy. So those geom segments provide the, the, the stock of the lollipop. Okay. And you've got another little quiz to do, which I'm gonna see if I can pull up. I'm not sure you can let me know if it's not working for you guys. Um, where you're asked to, you're given a data set, and you have to figure out should this be geom, geom call or geom, or geom bar.
Okay, so this is what we get. So you get to choose right there. Uh, that's our first question. There's a second one then, you get a Midwest bar chart. So the way this works is as follows. Um, <clears throat> the Midwest is a data set. If you click on run code, it'll actually kind of give you a little kind of presentation of what that data set is. So these are all counties in five different states across the Midwest of the states. This Illinois is that there. So there's Adam County in Illinois, and it gives its area, its population, population density, and so on, different, different kind of parameters for that particular county. Uh, and it goes from Illinois, Wisconsin, I think Ohio's in there someplace, uh, Michigan. That's the Midwest data set. You asked to make a bar chart of the number of counties in, the, in these states. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take Midwest and then we're gonna feed in with this little kind of pipe thing. So percentage sign, arrow percentage sign. We're gonna feed that into ggplot. We're gonna give it uh, the right aesthetics and we're gonna call the right feature for that. So I want you guys to look at that for a second. And when you're happy with it, you can press run code. Now, for me, like I've got nothing here, like I know aesthetics, it just gives me a blank canvas. So we need to give some aesthetics. Run that. And now it has, it gives me the, the five different states along the bottom line, because that's set up the x-axis for us. But then you want to add in either a geom bar or a geom call. And that'll do the magic for you. So you have to count. If you have to count, then it's geom bar. Run that, and that seems to work pretty well. And then just to make it prettier, we can do a, a quick flip. And that gives our data set. Do you guys all get that? And then if you're stuck, um, these hints are tend to be they tend to be the solution. So if you click on the hint, it'll tell you that. Actually, no, it doesn't. If you give the hint, it gives you like the first line, the first step to do. So you can kind of copy that and then put that in place. And it doesn't tell you what the point is. Often, like the, these ones, the hints will tell you what the actual answer is, but not in this case. Okay. So that's Midwest. Then we have our penguin bar chart. So we, we looked at our penguins before. Um, how many wheat species do we have? So that's up to you guys. That's our data set right there. And as you can see, we have like Adelaide's and we have, well, the weekend and chin traps as well. And then when you're finished with this, we have the mammal sleep data. So again, we take from there, you're gonna have to add in that little kind of dilly bob, pipe it through. So we have our, our mammal sleep data. And we have a look at that. We have different mammals right there and we have picked up just carnivores from that data set and it'll tell us should be able to scroll across it gives kind of um oh yeah across over here it tells us how heavy they are and what their body weights are and also how much sleep they that they typically take every day so from there we're gonna have to like pipe that through and make a uh, make a bar chart of their sleep times so total sleep time is in the, is in the sleep uh, underscore total. Over to you guys. I'm gonna get a glass of water. I'll be right back.
How are you all doing? I'm trying to do the penguins one at the moment. And again, the first question, should this should it be GM bar or GM call? Eugene, can I ask what's going on with the um, on the penguins data set? You've got Palmer penguins and then two colons and then penguins. What's that about? Right. Um, so the Palmer penguins is a it's a library, it's a package, and then uh, what that two columns is, is means that well, there's two ways to access this. You can first of all load up the entire library, so you can library Palmer penguins. And it brings in all of the data sets that are contained therein and the functions that it has. Or if you don't want to do that, what you could do is you can just specify Palmer Penguins double colon, mean that if you want to find this Penguins data set, go and look in Palmer Penguins. Right. But don't bring on board the entire library, just bring in the, the part you want. And there are two times you might do that. First of all, is when you have you have a, a large library with lots of different functions and you just want to have one specific thing. It makes it more kind of, makes your kind of your code less clunky. Um, uh, you don't have like everything coming aboard. And the second time is there are some, you know, remember R is built by, um, it's crowdsourced. So um, if you have enough libraries, eventually you have people calling their function the same name. And if you want to specify go to this library to find, like for example, filter is a classic one. Lots of libraries have a function called filter. And if you want to specify which library to look in to find the filter you want to work with, um, you, have, you can use like, for example, uh, the plier colon colon filter. Um, and that way it'll look in the right place to find the function you need. So there are the two times you might use that. So it's specifying penguins within that library. Right, thank you. Is everybody okay? Could I have thumbs up if you're, or thumb, can you do thumbs down as well? So, um, do you want more time or should we move on now? I'm, I'm fine to move on. Okay, let's plow ahead then. So now that's amounts of stuff. Uh, how many penguins we had, 
um, how long you sleep, very amounts of stuff. A similar concept then is proportions. So uh, how much of like, uh, we said we have like, you know, uh, six women, three men. Uh, that means we have uh, a twice as many women as guys. Uh, that's the proportion. So to get a proportion, um, we're gonna talk about three different things over here, stack bar plots, pie charts, and waffle plots. I gotta say, I don't like any of these. Uh, I much prefer to look at amounts, raw amounts, rather than trying to divide that down to a percentage, but that's not always, that's, people don't always agree with me. So let's take our, go back to Gapminder, um, our Gapminder data set. Uh, and we're gonna just pick out, we're gonna look at populations across the world and how many people live, uh, what fraction of the world's population live in different continents. So looking at the numbers over here from 2007, you can see that the um, Asia, for example, has uh, more than half the world's population. And then the Africa, America and Europe are more or less, you know, similar kind of numbers. And then Oceania, Australia, for example, is much smaller. So here we have our data set right there. And we want to present this as being kind of, we want some kind of a, a chart that will show half the people live in Asia. So to get that, uh, what we've done over here, let's kind of talk to this. So this is where we were uh, up to here a second ago, before we did ggplot. Uh, ggplot does all the work. So we're giving, we're giving that data set, we're giving these numbers, that 949910, we're giving that to ggplot. Now, in this case, it doesn't, remember in our, in our bar plots, we had our contents lined up one after the next. Uh, in this one, we have them on top of each other. So we have the rather strange thing of having, instead of having for our x-axis, we just say one. We got to give it an x-axis uh, because we have, in this case, we have an x and a y chart. Um, but we want everything on top of each other. Uh, we don't want to separate them out. So we just give it one, that number one as being our x-axis. The population is going to go along the y-axis. That's what he is doing. And then we want to have different colors depending on what your content you are. So uh, that's what, so this aesthetic, the fill, this block of color uh, will depend on what the content is. Now, so then we have, it's a geom call because we have our numbers in place. Looking at over here, we have, we don't have to do any counting. So it's a geom call. Uh, we got to tell to put them on top of each other. So we have position stack. Uh, is one option. Um, there are different, we could have diff uh, there's dodge, for example, to have them side by side. We want them on top of each other, so we have position stack. And this show legend false right there. So we don't want to have, what the legend is, is beside the plot something, we've seen these later on, beside the plot, they'll have like a little kind of a graphic that says that uh, pink is Asia, blue Africa, green America, and Europe is kind of some kind of drab olive color. Um, but we don't want to show that. We'll do it differently. Uh, we have our population label, population millions. Okay. Uh, and then we have this geom text repel. This puts the content name and the population in millions within each block. That's what he's doing. What and does the. Says, um, where to put him right there. Eugene, what does the glue, <clears throat> the glue function that you've got there? What's this the position then kind of puts those kind of content labels in the right place. <coughs> I'm sorry. And then that's how big the text should be. Um, so that is that size right equals six right there. That's an attribute. It's the same for all of our text. And then your geom void, he is useful for getting rid of everything else. So he gets rid of all the, the axis labels and the, 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 the graphing part. Remember, GGBot makes graphs. So he gets rid of all the axes, axes and the ticks and all those kind of marks are gone with geom with the theme void. Right there. Now, and then one last thing we're going to do. There's our fundamental plot right there. That's a like a stacked bar plot. But then to make that into a pie chart, we use chord and polar, theta equals y. And that gives us kind of our, that gives us our, our pi plot. Because, <coughs> but pi, pi charts get a bad rep in data science. Um, 
And I guess maybe because of that, I'm not sure why, there really isn't kind of a good, there isn't like a one-stop shop to make a pie chart in, in, in ggplot. It doesn't like doing it. So you got to kind of turn through this little hoop over here uh, of making a stacked bar chart and then at the very end, making it polar with this coordinate polar heat equals y. And that kind of gives our picture. And you're going to see over here that Asia has more, more than half the population. Okay, so. Eugene? Yeah? Can we ask, what does that uh, glue function do? Uh, glue is lovely. I'm a big fan of glue. Uh, it comes from the glue library. Uh, so what it does is it takes some, it makes a text string. So America's 910 million right there, it makes that. And <clears throat> it does it, these little curly braces over there indicate that you want to look at the, you want to look at your data frame to, to find what should go inside in this loop between the brackets. So it's gonna look into our data frame. It's gonna find the, the column, which is called continent. I've got to take the values from there. And then it'll take the column, which is called population and take the values from there and stick them together. And then that M right there, you can type whatever you want to for that. Um, that's like just some free text. So it's a way of making kind of a, it's a way of pasting together uh, different labels using the, 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 using the, the values which are found within your data set. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, so glue glue is kind of pretty useful. There, there are, I mean, there's, there, there, there's a function called paste, which is kind of, it's in base R, um, but it's just kind of clunkier. And you got you to gotta stick things together. Eh, but glue, glue works very nicely. So I like glue. Now, uh, what are we doing over here? So again, we have our, our, our get winter data set. Again, we have our year uh, and we have our populations. Looks like we've rounded them off here. Oh yeah, this is a waffle plot. Okay, so uh, this does the same job, <coughs> but what it's done is it's taken our population, these numbers over here, and it's taken 10 boxes for Africa 10 for the Americas, 40 for Europe, for Asia, eight for Europe and so on. So it's rounded our population off to different levels. Um, each one represents one E5 means 100, uh, 100 um, sorry, it'll be, yeah, 100,000 people. Uh, actually more than that, it'll be 100 million people. And this waffle function, uh, makes a waffle plot. And we say we want to have five rows uh, right here for all of our boxes. And we can see that this big blue chunk in the middle is Asia. Uh, these are um, the Americas and Africa, and that'll be Europe, and that'll be Oceania. Again, it's a way of representing proportions. And again, a lot of people do this, but I don't like it very much. So I'm not gonna talk about it very much. And then lastly, um, of course, uh, we're gonna have, uh, these are all the counties of Ireland right there. It tells you what, we have four provinces. So Ulster's up north, Connacht out west, Leinster uh, around Dublin in the east, and then Munster is the one down south. And this herd tells you how many cattle we have in each, each county. Uh, so there are 38,000 counties uh, cattle in, in Donegal. That's our data frame. Uh, so what we have is, again, we're setting up our ggplot, which has, uh, we're putting the area is proportional to herd, fill on which is the color within each kind of block will depend on, on the province and then our label will be county uh, which is the, the name of the county uh, Dublin, Donegal, Cork and so on. And Geom tree map makes us into a big block like this so it kind of takes all those areas and tries to mash, mash them together like a jigsaw uh, to fill up an area of space. Here we have our legend on the right, which is the, the four different provinces. And you can see that, that, that if you're kind of the pinkish color, you are from the west, from the west, from Connacht. Um, and then our tree map text then puts labels in place. So we have, if there are lots and lots of cows in Galway, so that kind of has this space over here. Uh, there are very few cows in Carlow or Kildare, small little counties. So they get these little boxes right there. And they're very few cows at all in Dublin, which is because it's old city. <clears throat> so that gets a little kind of box up in the top right hand corner. 
So that is a, that's like a tree map. Uh, and again, it represents proportions. So can we have all our, our cows? Um, this is where you're going to find them. And Excuse lastly, because of this data comes from Eurostat. So we have a, a label, our, our caption for this, saying where we got our data. Can I ask that uh, grow equals T, does that mean the, the text will scale based on the size of the, the box in each um, county? Yes. Okay. That's exactly what it means. Thank you. So if, if you go to if you go to R, this is the this is from the library waffle. Uh, or sorry, that's let's see, it's the library tree map. <clears throat> and if you type question mark geom tree map text, it'll kind of give you the different parameters right there. Actually, let me just show you that if you don't mind. Please do. So when you go to our studio, let's kind of load up our library pre-map. And then if we type in question mark, geom pre-map text. Oh, what was it called again? Yeah, I'm not pulling that up. I must have the wrong library. No, oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the wrong library. I have, to, I, have to, I have to Google that. But anyway, if you look at that, if you look at that, uh, if you look at different functions over here, for example, geom bar, it'll give you a listing of what the what the function is and tell you there's different parameters you have for that uh, and gives you some suggestions of what the, what the defaults are, some detail of them. So if I find out what the, the right library for geom tech cream out text is, I could figure out where to, where to find it. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Eugene, just before we move on from the tree map stuff, would there be a way to kind of group the colors together so that they kind of oranges stay together, green stay together? That's a really good question. Um, so if you look at this, this this is essentially a map. These these are all kind of uh, these are all counties, uh, and they have like the, the blue ones should be down south, and they're not. Um, there's a way of doing this, uh, which is. Um, Essentially, what you're looking at over here is a map. And there is a library called, there's a library called, I don't remember what it's called, but it gives you a function called facet map and lets you kind of specify. Um, I'll pull up an example during, during the break over here so I'll show it to you. Uh, for example, you could specify, the one I remember is specified the United States and the 50 states they're in. And it'll have California at the at the west. It'll have New York in the top right hand corner. So you can specify there where the different kind of county, where different states should go based on their geographic location. Oh, that's pretty um, really cool. So to get that, that's that's a process called faceting, um, and it'll it'll do that for you. But you have to put up this library in place, and that library will have for different, like it'll have for Europe, it'll have the countries of Europe, it'll have the there's one for there's one for the um, different locations within, within the UK. Uh, and then it'll kind of take care of their putting them where they should be. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know a way of doing it for by to keep all the blues together without having information about the map itself. You know what I mean? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if map is smart enough to, that, to do that for you. Okay. Uh, no worries. That's cool. It might be, you. but I'm not sure. But I know, I know like for, 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 for mapping, uh, which is like a world in itself, there are ways in which you can kind of um, specify that if it's that location, if it sees the word uh, Somerset, it should be down south. If it sees Northumberland, it should be like the, the, the top, top right corner. Do you get the idea? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Okay, so that's, um, I'll, I'll pull an example up for you then during, during our break. Thanks. Uh, I think we're finished this section now. Okay, so that's summary proportions. Uh, so we want to know kind of a again we have we have a, a data set which has 
different amounts of different things in it, and we want to present those about how much, what ratio of the total number uh, is in different categories. Um, that sort of proportion gives for us. Okay, and you have, right then, you have a problem to do now. So we wanted you guys to make a pie chart for us. And again, if you click on the hint over there, you'll have some indication of what the answer might be. Um, actually, it gives, you this, it gives you the entire answer, but have a crack at it first. So from, there's our data set with movies. Um, we have our gross amounts over here. So we want to have the news of the world to be is the most popular movie this week. Um, so we want it to have the biggest area of our pie chart. Over to you guys. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pull up an example of a proper tree map. So that, that one which kind of maps things where they should be is called Facet Geo um, from the Geo Facet Library. And when you pull up, when you pull up Facet Geo, It has a large number of, it knows about a lot of different, different geographic locations. I can imagine using that for Wales for some kind of project for sure. It's very nice. Uh, so does Australia. So all these grids over here, for example, are there's one for Australia. And it'll have like details about the different kind of provinces in Australia where they are. Does it have Wales? I don't know. You can do your own. Um, oh, cool. We did we did the one for Ireland because it's actually not in the not we had to add it in. It's got Scotland. I don't see Wales. I'll send them an angry letter. You definitely should. It doesn't have Wales. Never mind. I've got the French departments. That means it's it's got to be done. So there's there's a way in which they they 
the people who build this library are looking for new grids. Um, so if you go to GitHub, you can uh, you can develop a grid for the different locations in Wales, and you can submit that, and they will uh, lap it up because they, they like these things. So to create and submit your own grid, click here. Oh, cool. Um, and you then like you gotta you gotta make a you've got to make a data frame which has well let will talk you through it, but there's kind of a there's a routine for, for doing this and you submit that and they'll get the they'll pick it up. They'll pick it up. I like the idea of that. That's what open source is all about, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you, you pick up software from like Microsoft, for example, and it's really good software, but it's made by like a handful of people. Um, whereas like Arc and is made by a whole community and it's, it means that there's a bit of everything in there, but it's, uh, it's kind of nice to be able to, 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 to chime in as well. So oh, that's our pie charts. How do you guys get on with your pie charts? Yeah, they're good. I was wondering with pie charts, do you always have to create like the geom call first? And then the I've chart? only ever seen it done that way. I've only ever seen it done that way. And then with the quoted polar afterwards. Okay. Um, the equals y. Um, like I say, the, you think there should be like a one stop shop, which is just like, you know, pie chart and then like you give it a data frame and it does the work for you. Yeah. yeah on pie I've, never across, I've never come across one. Uh, there's a gap in the market. There is like there should be a GG pie chart. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a bit of a fudge. Uh, like I say, perhaps it's because they have such a bad rep in, in data science. Yeah. Uh, I actually quite like them, but I agree they do. do get yeah. Slack. P people don't. Um, they're like, they're like one step ahead of donut charts. Prior to data science. <laughs> so when we actually, what do our movies look like? So there, that's what the picture kind of should look like at the end. But you can kind of make it a little bit better. I didn't label the sections over here and not give numbers in them. Do you remember that part where we had like a, a geom text thing? Yeah. When we finish this action. Yeah. So that's the end of our section here. Shall we take a coffee break for five minutes, everybody? Um, and then we'll yep. that'll be good. Pick it back up again for we'll talk about distribution and relationships before lunch. Perfect. Great. Cool. So I'm going to turn off my camera and then come back at, uh, let's say, quarter to 12. I'll pause the recording also. Start the recording. Harvey found the GeoFacet Lab uh, web page. I thought it might be useful to share. It is, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so you can see they've got a map of the states right there with a the different kind of, they're plotting unemployment rate over, over time for different states. Um, you can see that big spike around 2008, kind of with, at the financial crisis. Uh, and here they're plotting the GDP in Europe. So again, the different countries in Europe and, and roughly we're speaking where they, where they sit geographically. So I feel like Ireland's a bit more like Scotland than anything else at this stage.
So um, let's get going again then, shall we? And our next pack of notes is about um, distributions and and relationships. So, uh, so distributions are basically, um, I guess, histograms is the best way of looking at them. So you have some quantity, like if you have a, if you have a hundred people and how many of them are different, fall into different age categories, uh, that's a distribution. Uh, they could be normal, or they could be skewed, or they could be exponential, or they could be um, uh, Poisson, that's our binomial, uh, the kind of statistical kind of words we have for these things. Uh, and then a relationship is like a, like a plot graph. We looked at our penguins first off, and we said that if you have a longer bill, you probably are, have a, a bigger body mass. So that's a, that's a relationship. So we're going to look at those guys in this pack of notes. Uh, so this is the, the red category. So for distributions or histograms, density plots, box plots, violent plots, and ridge plots, there are our hit list of things to, to talk about first off. Um, so let's look at some basketball players. So how we do this. So there's our data frame over there. Uh, we have getting on for 4,000 different basketball players. And we're told uh, what their career, like for example, uh, our first guy, I don't recognize the name, but he played for eight, for 19 years. It gives his height, his weight, uh, his birth date, and what college he's from. So that's kind of a, a player. Uh, should also give his, yeah, his position. So he's a center. So we have centers, guards, and, and, and forwards. So again, we're setting up our ggplot. Uh, the ggplot itself gives us the blank canvas. Then Within that little bracket over there, we're uh, having the aesthetic weight, which will go on the x-axis. It's the first thing, so it's x equals weight. And our pipe right there kind of takes our, our data frame and feeds it into ggplot. Our next layer then puts them on top of that a histogram. Um, so here we go. Uh, for our basketball players, uh, you can see that they're the distribution. Um, they're roughly maybe 80, 90 kilos, uh, like this. Um, there's some guy who weighs 100, 170 kilos, which is pretty massive, and somebody else who's 55. So there's quite a spread uh, for our basketball players. Uh, Geohistogram is the layer. And then within that layer, we have the fill. 5 by 4 is a attribute, so it's the same for all of our bins. And we set bins equals to 50. There's a default, I think, about 30 bins in for histograms in R that it picks out. But when you have so many values, um, if you have over 3,000 values, uh, it's worthwhile having more bins. Uh, and then we have some, some text we put on top of this. Uh, the weight in kilograms, we put that onto, onto, the, uh, onto our x-axis. Um, Eugene, could I just ask, um, could you just quickly explain what, how bins should be used, please? Uh, in other words, what number there should be. Well, what, what do they mean? What are they? Okay, so, so what we have is we're looking at the weights of our basketball players. And you can see like that the first guy's 102 kilos, 73.5 kilos, 101 kilos. What our bins will do is this. It'll take our players and it means that there are of that data frame of our 3,000 basketball players, there are about 220 of them which have a weight somewhere between maybe 98 and 100 kilos. So it takes, our, it takes the range of our different data. <coughs> it looks at the lightest basketball player and the heaviest one. It splits it in, into 50 different kind of gaps. Um, so we're going from say 50 to 200. So then each gap will be three kilos wide. So if you have a, a mass between 50 and 53 kilos, it will be down over here. If you're between 53 and 56, you'll be in there. If you're between 150 and 153, you'll be in there, and so on. So it splits it out that way. That's really interesting. And then so, counts, counts how many are within each within each grouping, how many basketball players have a mass between 100 and 103. There's about 200 of them. So for just for an example, could we see what happens if bins were 10 in this, just so I can understand it? Um, or am I derailing it too much? You, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's let's try this. Um, so, so just just it literally just means the number of columns, accepting the fact that some columns won't exist. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. 
Yeah. Yeah, it makes them wider. It's actually, it's a very important kind of question. Um, just as a kind of a, a, a side story, uh, the best example of this I know is the, um, the guys took data from marathon times. Uh, like you have a lot of marathons around, well, you used to have a lot of marathons around the world and each time there'd be like tens of thousands of people running, uh, London Marathon, New York Marathon, et cetera. And they record the times for everybody who can reach the race and, and publish them. So, so many kind of went to the trouble of looking at different marathon times and like scraping them off the web, putting them all together and ended up with several million different kind of runners who had kind of competed marathons and what their times were. And when you plot them on a histogram, get a lovely normal curve, that kind of bell-shaped curve, get a lovely normal curve for the histogram. That looked just great. But when you have so many different values, like, like we're saying, like north of 2 million of them, you can have very narrow bin widths and still have enough people in each bin that you don't get a lot of noise. So if the bin is too narrow with too few people in there, it starts to get kind of noisy and flacky and, and, and not so nice. But with so many, you can have quite a narrow bin width of like of a fraction of a minute and yet have a nice smooth curve. And when you reduce the bin width, what they found was all of a sudden there were these spikes appear. So it's a, a spike in times just before two and a half hours and a spike just before three hours and a spike just before three and a half hours. And what's happening is that like, if you're running a marathon, you're, you're there, like you're in the home stretch, you, you, know, you see what the clock is doing. You say, great, I've got a goal to beat three hours. So you're gonna put an extra effort in to try and make that time. So you ended up having more runners who are finished just ahead of three hours and then kind of a, like a, like a shadow then afterwards. Uh, That's really cool. Yeah, so, like, so adjusting bin width is important. There are kind of, there are routines to, that kind of try to guide you how many bins there should be. Um, but it's, I think it's, they're called things like Sturgis and Freeman Draconis. And essentially what they do is you take the number and you take the square root. So if you have hundred measurements, you should have 10 bins. And if you have 10,000 measurements, you can have hundred bins. Uh, that's kind of their hand waving ways of describing how many, how many bins there should be. But it's a, it's, it's a bit of a black art rather than, than, than a science. Um, that's really helpful. Are, Thank you. Because are histograms. So yeah, it's a, it's a very important question, like how many bins should there be, what, what, the, what the bins specifies. That's a, that's a, that's a, a key thing to, to produce a good histogram. Uh, okay, that's our basketball players. Um, but you remember that there's more than one type of basketball player. We have centers, guards, and forwards. So if we do the same thing, now we've got a histogram. Uh, let, let's, let me compare it just first of all. So there's our histogram right there of all of our basketball players. What we can do is we can take their position and make that important. So we can try and like unpick like, you know, which guys are, depending on what position you play, are you gonna be heavier or lighter? So now we have this extra thing of fill equals position. So remember fill kind of, you have, you have a block of color. Um, what the fill does is like that, 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 that describes to that block, you know, uh, the, the C, the F and the G. And we have, now we have to have less bins because, you know, we'll have essentially three histograms instead of just one. So there'll be less in each, each one. And we have position equals dodge. So you end up with this. So you can kind of see that there's the blue guys. It's like a, a bell curve over here. They're the guards. For the forwards, there's another, they tend to be heavier. And they have like this kind of histogram. It's, there are less of them. So it's smaller and they tend to be heavier. And then for the green guys, again, you can just about kind of make out that their histogram is like there. So that's our data. It's kind of hard to see exactly what's going on over here. You have to like peer your data quite closely to see that, see those trends. <clears throat> and we just label them like that. Is there a better way? Well, the answer is always yes to look at that question. So again, we have their weight going on the, on the x-axis. And now we don't have fill, we have call equals position because we use fill when we have a solid block of color. Now we're using COL for color because we're just gonna have a line. Let's see how we do that. <coughs> and here we have our basketball players again. You can see here we have the blue guys, our, uh, our guards, they are lighter and there are more of them. Okay, so they're, they're actually, no, I have to rephrase that they're lighter and this is a higher curve because these now are normalized. So we've done two things over here. We've replaced 
we've kind of drawn our line through these points of our histogram to figure out how they're distributed. So ending up with a, like a blue kind of curve, a green curve and a red curve. But in addition, what we've done is we've normalized. So in other words, uh, see that, that, there, that there are very few centers right there. So that's why these blocks are so low. But we don't really care about how many centers there are in our data set. We just care about how they're distributed. <coughs> so that way we kind of, the area under each of these three curves will be the same. And the reason why the blue curve is taller is because there's a narrower spread of people who play guard. They tend to be around 80 kilograms. They're never gonna to be too much heavier or too much lighter. Does that kind of make sense? So in this way, kind of yes. we've done two separate things over here. We pick out <coughs> the shape of our histograms more carefully. And by normalizing, we get a better picture of how much spread there is. Guards tend to be more or less the same. Forwards or centers tend to be more spread out, heavier, and there, there's a more, a bigger range of values of their, of their weights. Eugene, can you, we just, do, can, can you just, sorry, can you just clarify the difference between using fill equals position and call equals position? Yes, again, really good question. So they, they'll, they both kind of determine what the color should be. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a very kind of common pitfall to, to, to get them mixed up. <coughs> you use fill when you've got a solid block of color. So we look at our, look at our histogram here a second ago. These bars, they're solid, they're solid kind of shapes of color. So they get filled. If we had call equals position, what would end up with it would be like, um, they'd end up being, they'd be marked out, but they'd be like e empty rectangles. So you'd fill out the perimeter of those blocks and the, the center would still say white. That would, that would happen if you had call equals position there at this point, you'd still see the histogram, but instead of having a block of color like this, you just have the outline of the, of, of the, of the rectangles will be, filled, will be given that color. Could those two be used in conjunction in order to maybe have the same color of bar, but have them distinct by one being filled and the other not being filled? Yes, yes, um, very much so. Yes, you, you can, uh, it gives you an outline. So yeah, you can, mm. um, uh, you can do it that way. Or yes, uh, if you want to, for example, there's no gaps between them over here. If you'd like to have a little kind of gap separating our, our, our different bars, you'd have like, you'd have call equals white. And therefore, David, the edge would, would be colored white, and you'd see the gap between our, our different bars over here. So yeah, you can have you can have both in conjunction. Interesting. Thank you. That's really helpful. Uh, I've got um, some epic uh, to do for. And for there. this guy, I use call because now, if we use fill over here, what would happen is we'd have this whole wedge, will be colored blue. Um, which is fine but then you couldn't see the green line behind it. So you'd end up with these three guys would be on top of each other. You'd have three kind of wedge shapes, one solid blue, one solid green, one solid red, and whichever's on top would obscure the other ones. Now you can get around that by having, making them like semi-transparent. Do, do you remember we had this thing called alpha? So alpha, alpha equals one means it's solid color. Alpha equals zero means it's completely transparent. So if we had an alpha maybe about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, we could see through our, our little wedges and we'd be able to see what's happening. For example, if, if the green with the red guys on top, we'd see the green shape behind it. Um, so we could use fill here as well. But when we do that, in this case, we'd probably have to set a transparency by alpha equals something. Um, one more thing I wanna point out about this is in all of our layers so far, we've had geom something. Now all of a sudden we have stat density. And here's a funny thing. If you recall, when we talked about geom bars, we said that it actually does a lot of work for you in the background. It does some counting. So it's, it's as well as producing a layer, it's got to do kind of a bit of our arithmetic. So here we have <clears throat> this stat density okay, is telling us about the kind of arithmetic it's doing. And then geom line means it's producing a line little curve like this. 
So there, there are two separate things going on over here. There's a calculation of where the line should be and the production of the line. So the stat density kind of actually goes and figures out from those histograms we had a moment ago, how to link them all together. And then the geo line produces a line between them. And then this position of density, just like is, I'm not sure why that's, yeah, that means that it's a, um, rather than moved side by side, they're, they're on top of each other. Uh, basically, the, what I do is I just lift this routine wherever I want to produce a density plot. I just lift this the way it is without kind of, I, 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 have, I can't claim to know exactly what's going on in the background over here, but that little bit of code gives me a density plot. I wish I knew exactly what was going on. And then we have some captions. Okay. Oh yeah, I like this part. So there's one more there. This is like our nice little plot over here. We have like labeled everything. It's kind of looks pretty good. We have this part of the legend over here telling us about the different positions we have. But this one extra feature at the end is a geom rug. And see what's happened? this guy over here, these little dots appeared underneath our graph. And these are actual players. So here we have a center who has a weight of 175 kilos. Here we have a guard who's got a weight of just over 50 kilos. So each one of these little dots represents an actual player. Their color is their position. And the position of the little, 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 little tick is um, what, their, what their weight is. And this kind of goes to the principle of whenever you have the chance, within a visualization, you should show your raw data. It's like this kind of, the density plot, you can't figure out exactly where everybody is. But having the rug there, without too much extra ink, we get to show our extra our, our raw data and doesn't obscure our density plots. So it's kind of good practice to do that. Uh, and this geom rug is not a nice little routine to be able to produce that. We can always add that to, to a, a distribution plot. Now, what do we do next? Again, our basketball players. Uh, again, our weights and positions. Okay, this is a box plot. So again, if you remember, looking at it, uh, centers are heavier, forwards and center, and then the guards are lightest. And here we can see the same precision again. Centers are heaviest, forwards in the middle, guards are lightest. And these are box plots of their, the distribution of these masses. So again, we have this guy, this very light guard who is just over 50 kilograms. There he's right down there. There's a little dot over here. Um, these are other, these dots are <clears throat> more players who play in that position and, and their masses. The vast bulk of players are inside in this box. This line over across over here is the median. So half of all guards are lighter than 80 kilograms and half of them are heavier. That's our box plot. And these top and bottom lines, they represent the 75th and uh, sorry, the, the 25th and, and the 75th percentile. So uh, a quarter of all guards are, are lighter than that. A quarter are heavier than that. And half of them live in this box in the middle, somewhere between uh, 80 and maybe 90 kilos. Does that kind of make sense? There's our box plot. And then these whiskers, these lines going out, they have a length depending on uh, what, this is not quite true, but they, they go roughly speaking up to the 95th and percentile and the fifth percentile down below. So then they're kind of capturing this, the outlier spread. So the bulk of our players inside of here, the line across the center is our median. And then these kind of capture the most of our normal kind of players and the dots then are outliers. They're kind of beyond the pale. Cool. Um, that's our box plot. Um, we have show legend equals false here. If that was true, well, what happened would be we'd end up with a little kind of box over here telling us that <clears throat> red guys are centers, uh, green guys are forwards, and guards are blue. We'd have that little thing popping over here. That's the legend. But we don't need that because our C, F, and G are in place already. So to again, to avoid the idea of having superfluous, superfluous ink, uh, we kill that by the show legend equals false. And that's going to be true for every layer will have that option of killing off the legend um, if we need to. Okay, and then we have some labels coming into place. Now, uh, and again, remember we talked about our rug and how it's good to show our raw data. We're doing the same thing here again. This geom jitter, 
this puts points in place. So we can have geo and point there as well. And then you have like a line of points for all of our centers will be like lined up over here. All the little dots of every center will be lined up over here. But the problem is then that they're, they're an awful lot on there, maybe uh, over a thousand centers. So all these dots will overlap and be hard to tell if, you know, this would just be one continuous kind of red line because it all overlap. So to get over that, um, this geom jitter spreads them out a little bit randomly along the X direction. So you get some sense for how far our players are. Um, these are how big the dots are, 0.4. If they're any larger, they really can tend to swamp our graph. You can see there, but these, the outliers are full size dots. The ones for our um, jitter, for our regular players are, um, have been kind of made smaller. Uh, and actually if you look carefully, even our outliers, so that guy right there, there'll be a dot. I can't see it right now. There'll be a small dot someplace on the same height as him, which is, again, he also appears as a jitter. He's not excluded, so he'll appear twice. Uh, alpha equals 0.2. Uh, so therefore, they're pretty, you can see they're quite faded. Uh, if that was a full alpha, they would, again, tend to overload our plot. Um, we do want to show our data without overcoming the graphic. So that makes them mostly transparent. And again, our show legend equals false. Otherwise, you'd end up with our, our graphic over here of reds, greens, and blues telling us what they are, we know already. Um, that's our geom jitter. Uh, you can see as well, looking at this, there's quite a bit of striping going across here. So what's happening is that when you measure the weight of a guard, you can measure it maybe to the nearest kilo. So you'll end up with these parallel lines of lots of clunking of our players as because when the measurements are taken, they're rounded off to within a kilo, maybe half a kilo or so. That's our box plot. Now, what do we get next? Again, we have a, yeah, this will be a similar thing. Um, so our box plot looks like this and we get these big kind of clunky boxes over here. Um, an alternative, which maybe gives us an indication of distribution as well, maybe more clear than our box plot was, comes up next. Again, the same thing, our basketball player is getting fed into the GG plot. We put center forward guard along the X axis. We are having their weights along the Y axis and we're spitting them out by different positions. And these are violin plots. So they're very similar to, 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 to box plots, but now we have, it's like a histogram on its side or like a density plot on its side and then mirrored left and right. So if you kind of turn your screen sideways over here, we'll see that our centers are distributed like this we got a maximum round about there. And then we have a long tail as you get to do the, the guys who are kind of, who are very heavy. Uh, and we see our, like we saw before, our guards tend to be much more kind of a narrower spread of values. We get some kind of very light kind of, a, uh, some very light players, but most of them kind of are in around maybe 80 to between 70 and 90 kilos right there, the sharp peak. So these little plots over here, they're like histograms or like density plots on their side. And they kind of show us then um, the distribution as well as the location of our data. And then some nice labels. And again, we put our points in place and you can kind of see that they kind of make sense here. Our guards are all bunched around the center. Our forwards are more spread out and our centers uh, even more spread out. That's a violin plot. Now, what are we gonna do next? Uh, so our gap monitor data set. So this is kind of world population health data. Uh, life expectancy as a function of year. So yeah, this is a ridge plot. I like these a lot. So what you're looking at here is a density graph, okay, of life expectancy as a function of time. So if you look at the very bottom graph over here, this gives life expectancy and it gives it the, like, like a histogram for that in 1952, lots of people lived to like had a, a life expectancy of around um, maybe 40 or so. Uh, and then there's like a long kind of plateau of developed countries like um, which are have expectancies like around 60 to 70 up to 80 years old. Um, we probably have like Japan, for example, would be over here on the very right hand side. And then as time passes, what happens is this, they get the same kind of a density plot, but now for 1957. And this is going to move toward the right hand side as we progress in time. So, therefore, people are living longer. And more specifically, this hump here at, at uh, uh, around four years old 
this tends to die off. So that when we get to like 2007, almost all countries with life expectancies like over 70 years old. Okay, we still have got a long plateau of countries whereby there's um, uh, uh, we have to kind of work on this, um, but we see kind of a bigger hump then for uh, which is going to represent the people getting proper health care, proper, proper living conditions. This is done by geome density ridges, uh, which come from the uh, the GG ridges package. Uh, it's not within base R. Uh, and this kind of gives us format. And it's telling us, so here we have life expectancy goes along the x-axis, this goes right over here. And then the year goes forwards, goes kind of goes along the y-axis. And for each year, we'll, we'll produce a, like a ridge plot, which is like a density plot like this, uh, given our color, our fill, and our alpha. So the color kind of is the, this is actually what we talked about with color and fill a moment ago. Uh, the fill then tells us about the what's inside of each kind of, this kind of light purplish color. The color then is the outline, the edge of the, the, the plot. And then alpha 0 0.4 means that these guys are semi-transparent. So in other words, both the edge and the bulk are the same color, but the bulk is kind of semi-transparent of that by the alpha equals 0.4. So you can see kind of, otherwise we wouldn't we'll see the one for overlap like this. Um, so it's a beautiful way of kind of showing kind of a, how things, especially if they have to develop over time. I'm gonna mention this line for a second, back to a year. So when you go back to a raw data set, you'll see the years over here are just numbers. 1952, 1957, 62, and so on. They're just numbers. Um, but what we do with factor, and this is a, again, it's a, it's a frequent stumbling block is, we wanna say that there are only certain years are allowed. So we know that the, these measures were taken for 1953. There's no data with 1953, uh, only for 57, 52, 62, so every five years. And what factor does is it kind of, it solidifies that concept. There are only certain levels allowed. And when you go, when you go factor like this, it goes to our data set, it looks at the years, sees what values are contained there, and almost like it, it uh, certifies you, you as being a 52 or a 57. Are 62. So they're no longer numbers. They're, they're more like describing a category. That's what factor does. Um, and it's necessary because if we didn't do that, it wouldn't be so good at grouping together. It wouldn't take, you wouldn't be able to look at all the countries and say, hey, you're 1952. That, that measurement came from 1952 and not elsewhere. Uh, so it's, it lumps them all, all the 52 together in the way that it wouldn't do unless it knew about this. And that's kind of badly explained. I have to kind of make some sort of sense. So you're taking your continuous variable, which is the integer here, and you're making it into a categorical variable, which is certain prescribed values. Um, and if we didn't do, didn't do that, we'd end up with a big mess. Uh, so always when you have a, if your graph goes badly wrong, and um, this, this happens the whole time, uh, your uh, good reflex to have is, hang on a second, should I have a factor here? Do I have to establish the fact that only certain values are allowed? Um, and that's what's going on there. Uh, Eugene, can I just quickly ask, is, is it a better work process to, to change the data type to a factor when you're wrangling your data right at the outset before you start visualizing? Well, it's kind of necessary. It's, it's kind of a, it's in that if, I wonder, can I actually, give me one second, I'll show you what would happen if we didn't do this. I, I, just, I just meant at what point in the workflow you change it to a factor, should, should you do that when you're first importing the data and, and wrangling it? Or, or should you do it when you're actually plotting stuff? I would, I would leave to your, to your plotting stuff. Um, right. Because, uh, I, 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 again, it's, it's, a, it's a good point, and it's a, um, what's happening here is that you might want to have that raw data again for something else later on. So, like, if you think about a graphic, it's it's, it's a graphic is um, uh, they tend to come in packs. It's not just one picture; it's a sequence of pictures. 
So you want to have your data set amenable to maybe other graphs later on. Um, that makes sense. So in that case, it's kind of better to leave it raw as long as you possibly can. Uh, if I take this, uh, I'm going to click on copy code on this and then put that into R and see if it gets something funny happening. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with the our console. Uh, so, and then that's the code we have before. So that produces. Uh, so it produces that curve right there. If we didn't have factor, I wonder what, I wonder what it would look like. I, I suspect it would be a bit kind of fritzy. Or it might not work at all. It didn't like it at all. It didn't work at all. So you can see it kind of threw me an error over here. Uh, y equals year. It didn't like that at all. So it has to have the factor. It has to have, when you, with GG ridges, whatever goes along, whatever stacked up along the y-axis um, cannot be a continuous variable. I noticed the error message says uh, it's missing the aesthetic where, you know, you have put the y equals year there. It's just not recognizing it because it's not the factor. Yes. It would be helpful if R was to tell you not that it's missing, but just that it's in the wrong format. I know, error messages now are, are terrible. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, there was a talk, again, like, remember, remember we were saying that there's a, the, the R Studio conferences on this, this evening. There's a talk last year by Jenny Bryant about R messages, and how bad they are. Um, so it's, at it for some reason, we're terrible at this. Uh, so yeah, our messages kind of are not very informative and you're dead right. It should, it should, it should say something which is like, hang on a second. Uh, it's not the wrong shape for a, a Y variable. Rob, you, just, you got this badly wrong. Um, so I'm not sure why it says it that way. It, it, it just does. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's, yes, yeah, so it's, it's still there. It's just, it's not being picked up. Where are we? Oh, GG ridges. Okay. Um, so distributions. Um, whenever you're digging a data data project, uh, the first thing you like to do is look at each individual, each kind of variable independently, and see how it's distributed. Uh, if you're doing a machine learning project, for example, you want to have normal data as much as you possibly can. So really, it's, it's the first step in the in the data science project is to look at each kind of variable and see how it's how it shapes out. So distributions are maybe the first step kind of in, in, in the, any data exploration. And for that end, like our density plots or histograms are really important. And as we're saying over there, it's kind of nice to have our raw data with rug or jitter whenever we can. Uh, and then the use of alpha to, to, um, to reduce things. There's actually kind of a, there's kind of a rule of thumb about, uh, uh, which I'm going to put out right now, which is this. If you have less than maybe five data points, you don't really have enough then for just for, you don't really have enough for a, uh, for a graphic. Um, so uh, for the most part, if you have about 10 or so, then you can just kind of work with it with the way it is. You don't have to worry about kind of overcrowding or things like blocking each other out. So from 10 to 100, that's fine. If you've got more than 100 like different observations, different, different data points, then you have to start worrying about perhaps them getting in each other's way. So in that case, you'll, you can do things like, you can make, like, like we did with our basketball players. You can make the points smaller and you can make them a bit transparent. And that's kind of fine. 
And that works okay till you get to about a thousand or so. Um, and when you get beyond a thousand, it's uh, even with those kind of approaches, they start to get in each other's way. So at that point, um, to, to, to show those kind of guys, you have to go for other techniques like um, like density plots, which will look like, you know, like you look at a map and you have like mountains that are kind of have different shades from, from, from lowlands and that kind of stuff. You kind of color things out with uh, with, with uh, <clears throat> those, those uh, lines for different altitudes. We have something similar with data. So when the data is all clumped together, you'll have like a like a hot region. And as they spread it to be, to be more dilute, you have kind of, we have our lower, uh, we have our lower lands. So when you have more than a thousand data points, we have to start doing that kind of thing. These are called density plots. So that's our distributions. Now relationships. Oh yeah, you got a problem to do. So I'll let you guys work on this. There's uh, four different problems over here about histograms and density plots. So over to you guys. So you're asked to first of all draw a, so we have the country. So we get the Midwest data set. So the first thing you can type in here is Midwest. Okay. And then we're going to pipe that through like this. And then we want to make a ggplot of this. So you're going to call it ggplot. You're going to give it the right uh, aesthetics. And we're going to make a, um, uh, or actually in this case, just one aesthetic. And then we're going to make a histogram. So over to you guys. So that's the first one. Then we have data plots again, uh, taking our our Midwest data. We have an density plot. So if you want to remind yourself of that, we had the, the side where we made the density plot. That was the routine of stat density. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, position equals um, identity, and we have uh, geom equals line. So kind of copy that from from a previous slide uh, to make the density plot. And then we have an extra aesthetic because we're going to separate the that these out. Remember, we have five different states here within our, our, our Midwest counties. So we're going to kind of uh, split that up by different kind of um, by different states. And what's our last one? Oh yeah. And then you get this little challenge of that histogram right there to produce that from our, our Midwest data set. And for this problem, uh, you get a whole batch of hints depending on, there's a whole series of hints depending on, actually there are three of them. Uh, depending on like how much assistance you'd like, you'd like to get along the way. So there are four little problems. I'm going to give you guys maybe five or 10 minutes for this. Okay. Uh, I'm still here. So if you get stuck, you can, you can chime in and, can, and, and uh, either on the chat or else kind of uh, uh, with your microphone, you can let me know how it's going on.
Okay. Everybody all right? Anybody stuck? Anybody finished yet? I think I've just about done it. Um, I think I missed the bit where you explained about how, uh, where is it? Oh, I've lost it now. Um, where the scales equal, let me see. It's for the final histogram where it scales equal comma format. Um, yeah, I, well, yeah, I went through that very fast. I think I missed that, sorry. So, I mean, I've, I've done it thanks to the hint, but um, I'm just guessing, yeah, there must be the comma format separates the uh, thousands, I assume. Yes. So scales is one of those little super useful packages that we haven't like seen the last of them today. And what he does is like, it looks at the, in this case, the, the X axis. And we, we remember we, we, before we had, we wanted to have a dollar sign. So there's scales, colon, colon, dollar, kind of gave us that. Um, and then scales comma format is, looks at a large number and breaks it down like the way we normally do by having commas in place. Um, so if we, again, look at the help for this. So scales has lots of different bits and pieces, which are very useful. So comma format will tell us how that works. Great. And kind of, there she is. It takes a number and then kind of breaks it down and puts puts the commas in place the way we normally would come from, from writing a number. That's really useful, actually. <laughs> yeah, like the scales is one of those wonder packages that you know you, you keep on using again and again and again because it's got so many little bits and pieces which are just nice to have. Great, thank you. Welcome. Uh, shall we plow on then, see how we're getting on? So that's our little four, four little problems right there. Uh, right there. So now for relationships, um, this is when we have like an X and the Y. Uh, that's what we're talking about over here. Like with our penguins, we had like, you know, we had the length and we had mass, body mass. So they're called scatter plots. And we'll kind of talk about them in, in different kind of uh, uh, different features, uh, our line plots, and then we'll talk about correlations. So that's kind of our, our journey through relationships. So let's start with the stars data set, uh, which as, it's, as it kind of sounds like, has a whole bunch of different stars. And for each one, it'll tell you how bright it is. <clears throat> These are their absolute magnitudes, uh, where uh, the larger the number is, this is how, how bright they would be at a certain distance. And the sun is kind of quite a regular star, so it's gonna has 4.8 meters, that's actually not that bright. And stars like Regal, for example, is much, much brighter. These are their surface temperatures uh, in Kelvin, so 5,800, well, about 5,500 5, degrees Celsius. And then their spectral type, which depends on we their color. If they're yellowish, they're, they're, they're G type. Um, different letters will be, be redder or bluer stars. So here's our stars, stars data set. And we want to plot a graph where we have temperature and magnitude. So we want to have the temperature along this, 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 this x axis and the magnitude along y. And then the color will go by type. <clears throat> so here are all our stars. Each of these, these dots represents a star. Um, we're not showing the legend because there's quite a lot of different colors. So you'd have like a long list of different kind of values over here on the right hand side. And it would be kind of more confusing than informative. And we can see in general, we get this kind of this kind of curve that the cooler you are, the, the higher your magnitude. Remember, like um, these are dim stars and these are bright stars, if I've got that right. And therefore, hot stars kind of tend to be kind of brighter. I think I'm right about that. <coughs> so then we have this nice little thing called Geoman Circle. Um, so what it's done is it's taken a couple of types. It's taken B-type stars, which I think are the purpley ones. 
I'm kind of guessing. And it's also taken M type stars with, uh, which are greater, oh, <laughs> all the way around. So these are the M type stars, which are of the magnitude greater than nine. And these are the B type stars over here. And then it wraps them in a little kind of bag. So kind of, it, I guess it enhances those stars all belong in the same kind of grouping. Now, if we look what happens over here, look at our scale and temperature. We have lots of stars which are, which are quite cool, which are less than 10,000 degrees Celsius. And we have some stars which are super hot over here, which means that along our x-axis, most guys get shoved towards one side. Uh, and that's not good, not good to have that kind of spread. So therefore we want, we want to have a more equal kind of spacing of our data points along x. And to get that, we're going to use a scale x log 10 which now our scale is called 3,000, 10,000, 30,000, but they're not equally spaced anymore. This is a gap of 7,000 degrees uh, Kelvin, and that's a gap of 20,000 Kelvin. But looking at our graph, they're the same distance on the x-axis. So it's taking like a log scale on our x-axis. And now we have things much more spread out. Whereas our guys beforehand, these guys are all clumped like along one narrow kind of vertical strip. Now they're kind of spread out more. Uh, and we get, instead of like getting that kind of curve we had previously, when they got more like a, a straight line. Does that and not then, slightly obfuscate the message from the chart though? Pardon? Does, does that not obfuscate the message from the chart? As in, you know, it, it, if, if you weren't looking closely at the temperature there and you didn't know it was a, a scale X log 10, um, you may think it's a linear relationship kind of thing. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I guess, that to get that across, we probably have something in our title to, to spell it out that this is a log scale. So what, I'm just trying to think in, in which instances I, I would know to choose to do a log rather than... I was wondering that as well, why, why do you do it? Um, well, I guess here, looking at this, this graph, there's an awful lot of points which are clumped on one side. They're all bunched together on the left-hand side of our graph. And then we get the few super hot stars which are spread out towards the right. So they get a, a bigger kind of, I guess, a bigger leverage on the people's appreciation of our graph. And the trend here, like it's hard to see that looking at the, the, the looking at these kind of pinky dots here at the top left, right, left-hand corner, it's hard to see that um, as they go downwards, they are going towards the right. It's hard to see that because they are so kind of, they are so vertical. Okay, you know, that makes sense. So you're bringing out structure. You're kind of seeing the, the, the structure of the graph <coughs> a bit more easily. Um, it can often happen that you get, uh, when you have like some outliers, some very large values, you don't want to exclude them. Um, you want to keep them on your graph, but you don't want them to dominate things. So you want to have the, the guys which are more clumped together to have them kind of have some sort of influence on the appreciation appreciation of the graph. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's kind of it's a, it's a tricky enough point of when it's when it's a good thing to do and when it's not a good thing to do. So I think it's if you want a rule of thumb, um, if you want to be able to see trends within our graph better, uh, if you want to be able to to separate the points out more, it's probably a good thing to do. Uh, and it's certainly worth looking at to see kind of, does it does it give the, the, the message more clearly? Um, and it's, it still says, <coughs> it's still saying here that, okay, as you get hotter, your magnitude like, you know, decreases. So we get, we're getting a curve going from top left to bottom right. And it might also suggest that perhaps this relationship is not linear, but exponential. And we wouldn't know it unless we plotted it this, this way. Um, so yeah, so it's a moot point, um, but it's always kind of worth when we have like when we have a structure which eh, it's kind of hard to know what's going on. It's always worth looking at to see like does does the, the change of axis kind of scale help. And then we have uh, we put some. This is another layer. So what we have over here is we have some annotation on our, on our graph. So we want to spell out to somebody that these are type B stars, these are faint M stars. Um, and 
Uh, so we have annotate is the thing that does this for us. I want to we're annotating with text. So this is putting some 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 uh, some labels in. We gotta spell out where they're gonna be. So this is the x coordinates of uh, these guys first of all. So this is the first thing we write down, and this is the second one. So he has location of so that bit of text over here, type E stars, has that location one five zero zero along x and minus four long y. So that's the x y coordinate for this bit of text. And then the second bit of text, faint n type stars, which goes up over here. We have to specify he goes at 5,000 in X and 14 in Y right there. And as you can see, I got my colors wrong. So um, when you do this, I've set it to be blue and olive graph three. I should have actually specified the color for my bags as well to make sure that they, they, they sync up. So I should, I should specify him to be pink and him to be whatever kind of brown color that is. Okay, so that's kind of annotating. <coughs> and that's that's how you do it with the, that's how you do it in ggplot, this little annotate function, this annotate layer, and you specify like what you want to write down and what you want to write it. You have to kind of um, play around with the annotate thing to get it in the right place, or is the way is there a way to kind of link it? To... You got to play it around. Yeah. Uh, if my experience that my experience is with drawing kind of doing graphics is, if somebody comes to you with a if somebody comes to you with a data set. Uh, and they say, hey, we want to produce a graphic based on this. It takes about an hour. I mean, they'll tell you what they want to get across, what message they want to convey with their data. And it takes about an hour to get a, a graph which is saying the right thing. Uh, and that's kind of like using the right kind of right, the right geomes, having a box plot or a density plot or whatever it might be. It takes about an hour to do that. And then it takes, it takes about an hour afterwards to, 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 to fine tune it, to, to, to get things just right. And you spend a lot of time getting the colors right, getting, if you're annotating like this, getting the right positions for stuff, um, that kind of fine tuning to get it the way you want it to be. And it's often like just kind of fiddling and trying different things to see how they work. That's kind of a, that's my kind of rule of thumb. <coughs> so you spend as long doing that process of, okay, move it a bit, bit over here. You spend as long doing it that as making a plot in the first place. Okay, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there's an amount of kind of guessing and see how it works out and then try something else if it doesn't work out. Oh yeah, I did make my colors right, sorry. So I didn't like those colors very much. Again, these are default colors with an R and they're not, they're not very nice. These kind of browns and pinks and blues and actually they're not that distinct either. So we use a different color scale and we'll talk about this after lunch. So this is scale color grids and this kind of changes then these guys and they are a bit bit more distinct having put that in place. Okay, so, and then now we have a better match between what we use for our bags and for our text as we had for, uh, than we had before. Okay, and I think this is the last slide. Uh, this is a scatter plot. So the Galton Dalton Git data set, this is just an XY. So we have parents and childs. Um, what this data set is, is from a couple hundred years ago. Um, you take parents, you measure how tall they are, and you take their children, and you measure how tall they are. And I guess that then the message is, if, if, you have, if you're a tall child, you can have tall parents. Um, so we plot then the child height along the um, uh, y-axis and the parent height along the x-axis. <clears throat> we get this kind of curve over here. And looking at the, this kind of, this one, because they're measured to the nearest centimeter, the nearest inch, probably near the inch, uh, all the dots tend to sit on top of each other. But when we have, we have instead of using geom point, we use geom jitter. Uh, we get this plot over here. So uh, this plot is the one that you see on the left hand side with geom points, and then this plot is the one on the right hand side where we have instead of using geom point, we use geom jitter. And then we put them together. We can plot them together with this, with this uh, by just adding them. And this plot spacer has a gap in the middle. So that is that is just like again, like showing like a, an XY kind of scatter plot like that. 
Okay. You guys have, we're gonna take a break right now. Um, we're gonna reconvene again at half past 12, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, in, the meantime, in the meantime, if you had sold this, so if you're stuck for something to do over lunch, uh, we have a lunchtime challenge. So you're asked to produce that graph right there. Uh, just the way it is. And you're told you can do it kind of within the, there's a box below to do that. There's no hints this time, so you're on your own. Or I could do it within your own version of R if you, if you like to. And we're given them within the procedure tab, we're given some, some guidelines as to what might do. So uh, if you're doing it on your own kind of computer, you'll need to install the DS Labs package, which has the data you need. Uh, and it's called Death Probability. Uh, if you're just working on uh, this little box down over here, uh, in that case, you can go straight away from, uh, yeah. So you can start by going, it'll be loaded for you already. At least I think it is anyway. Ah, I don't. So I need to do this then. And does that work? Oh, it's not found. I've got the wrong name. Death prob. So we start with this. Huh. My apologies, maybe we'll do this then. Cool. So you need to begin with this, that little line right there, DS labs, colon, colon, death prob. That'll give you the data set, uh, which has uh, age, sex, and probability of death. And then you're asked to produce, to use those to produce that graph right there. And you can see we have the age and years along the x-axis, and we have death and probability. This is a log scale, that's at scale, this is scale y log 10 coming in place. Uh, and it kind of tells you, um, give you kind of a recipe for how to produce that. So if you care, if you so care to go for lunchtime, we can do that. And then we'll meet again at half past, half past one. Um, so I'll see you all later. Do you want to pause recording, Sharon? I'm trying to. I seem to have lost my icon to pause the recording. I don't know why. I, I am, my internet I, went down, so I had to rejoin. I can, I can stop it if you'd like me to. If you could stop it, yes, please. I seem to have lost my I'll icon. I'll see if I can make you again of the uh, co-host as well then afterwards. So I'm going to stop recording right now. So look, you're back in charge. Cool, we have two packs of notes left to go through. Um, and we have maybe kind of a, I think the, the more fun things to do that this afternoon, um, the more kind of I get the more artistic side of making good graphics. Uh, so in our first pack, we're gonna talk about colors and facets, and then we'll move on to themes and uh, was it themes and fonts later on. So, colors and facets. Oh, by the way, how did you guys get on with the um, lunchtime challenge? Anybody kind of anybody pick up the uh, pick up the gauntlet? Sorry, no, I got caught up on some email. <laughs> okay, well, it'll still be there. Just about it. On. Now, gave choice of colors. Sorry, I was just saying I gave it a go. Just about did it. Oh, cool, well done. I couldn't get the the title it wants to slide far off the right of the um, the preview. Ah, uh, I wonder. I'm not sure how to scale the title with the kind of width of the of the chart. So yours is wrapped around. So you've got two lines in your title. Yeah, um, the way to do that 
is, uh, let's see. So you go like probability, blah, 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 blah. So you got a string like this. Blah, 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 blah. And then to separate into two lines, you use a slash M. Ah, okay. Is the way to do that. And a back slash, okay. I'll yeah. give that a go. That's the job. Thank you. That's a separate of that. Uh, it's you can use you can use HTML within um, within R, but you have to have a package called uh, GG Text then, and you have to tell it that the specific string should be treated as HTML. Um, so when we talk about when we talk about um, themes uh, at the end of this, we'll mention how we might go about doing that. And once you have once you have HTML, there's a huge amount you can do with your with your text strings. Colors, colors are great. Um, they are probably for, for us when we look at any graphic. They're about the first thing we see is colors. Um, beyond actual position, beyond layout on, on 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 the graphic, they're the most striking feature. They're, they they trump like size or shape uh, all ends up. So colors are important. Um, they they give a look and feel to your graphics in the same way that nothing else does. Uh, they convey information, uh, and they also are, if you want to make your graphics sort of, to get your message across, it's important to draw your viewers in, and uh, colors do that kind of um, very strongly. Uh, so they're important that way. There's also, uh, with colors, there's, uh, they come as well with the condition of uh, not everyone sees colors the same way. There are, um, uh, visual defects, for example, with color vision. So we need to be able to use a color palette, which is going to be uh, amenable to everybody. So we'll talk about how we can do that later on as well. So, so colors are about separating things out. Well, if it's an aesthetic, it's about separating things out. We've seen that already. We had our basketball players. We had three different colors for different types of basketball players. Um, we did it for our penguins. Um, so we use colors quite a lot. To that end, we're going to take our color scale, the color palettes, and split them in three. So the first type of color palettes are ones like you can see over here. And what you have are colors which are distinguishable. So you want to make them as different from each other as possible. Uh, here we have some of the eight different categories. And those colors, like even if they're put side by side, you can tell that they are different from each other and you should be able to distinguish kind of um, uh, you should be able to distinguish up to eight categories like this with a certain amount of ease uh, based on this kind of palette. That's called a qualitative pal palette. So you want difference. You want to encode difference. And again, going back to color vision, um, if you look about these colors, if you were completely colorblind, they should be chosen so that even seen in black and white, they are different shades of gray. So therefore, uh, even for somebody who has color, um, color defects, uh, color deficient vision, that these kind of are, these are distinguishable. Our next palette is sequential. So what you have over here is something which gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So with the quality of palettes, we're encoding a categorical variable. You're a center or a forward or a guard. So you, can have, you are assigning people to different kind of uh, distinct and separate categories. With sequential, you're mapping your colors onto a continuous variable. So say, for example, if you wanted to take our basketball players, if you want to have uh, to map their masses and you wanted to, for example, have a have different color depending on what age the player was. So you have, say, that if you have their, their, their weights and their heights and you plot them onto a graph, but you want to have different colors depending on how old somebody is. Well, in that case, you can use a sequential palette. Uh, where somebody who's very young will have a, a lighter colored dot and somebody who's very old will have a, a darker colored dot. <clears throat> That's a sequential palette. And then our third type is diverging, which is kind of like two sequential palettes bolted on back to back. And what you have here is like you have like hot going to cold uh, and in the middle is like a reasonable temperature. Uh, so that's for diverging is that kind of thing where you have neutral in the center and you have the two extremes on either end. Uh, this could be kind of a median age and somebody who's uh, deemed to be a young player gets purple and somebody who's like at, at the end of their career is given green. 
So there are three kind of color palettes. Um, R is very good at colors. Uh, and there are large amounts of palettes which are dedicated to getting the right kind of set of uh, color schemes for your plots. <clears throat> we'll mention just a few of them over here. Uh, our color brewer um, is, is, gives you fine control over palette choice. So it's one of the original color, color packages and that does it very well. Um, Viridus, we've seen already kind of, uh, we had him in play for our stars and he kind of is good for giving kind of a, a vision impaired palettes. Uh, palette, because there's so many of these and there are an awful lot of these, there's a package called Palleteer, uh, which I find very useful. And what Palleteer does is it groups together to see all these different packages and you kind of put them in place on your system and they give you kind of color schemes and Palleteer lets you kind of see them all in one go and work with them all in one go. Uh, so it's kind of a clearinghouse for all your palettes that you have currently downloaded. <coughs> and there's two more kind of on the, on the regular ones like Wes Anderson and Artists are also kind of nice palettes. Let me show you Palleteer in, in, in action, if you don't mind. So I'm gonna go back to, go back to R. So if we go library Palleteer, right there and So palette here. These are our C for I think it's all like oh. and get the list of these. Um, right to dynamic. Oh, it doesn't like that here. Well, there's a way to list all these out, but I forget what it is. Sorry about that. But palette here kind of gets you see it, lets you see all your packages. Does it have any like of its own color schemes or is it just the combination of all the ones that you've downloaded? Just the combination of ones. Uh, it doesn't bring anything new, it just kind of lets you kind of let you cipher them out. Um, uh, so, and then artist, artist is quite nice. Artist is quite, it's quite new. Uh, it takes kind of pictures from, as I said, very different artists and takes those pictures and uh, will strip out kind of the, the color scheme. So there's a painting by Vermeer, for example, that has these are the, the dominant colors within there. That's what an artist does for you. Uh, so you can kind of give a look and feel to your, to your graphics based on, on, uh, on these guys. Uh, and there's more, um, there's TV themes. So uh, you have, uh, there's a lot of, lots of palettes, for example, from Harry Potter. Um, uh, and kind of different uh, different TV programs has their own kind of look and feel, so it kind of brings out their palettes. Uh, also, their fonts, for, for example. So um, we'll talk about fonts later on. Uh, Gigi Sai kind of takes palettes for scientific publications. Um, so the Lancet or the American Astronomy Association, for example, have their own palettes, and, and they um, they are there within um, with R. Um, there's also ways which you can choose colors. Uh, so color space does that. Um, these kind of launch programs that will uh, um, let you kind of bring up web pages that let you can choose colors. Uh, can I try, let me, am I risking tempting fate to try this again? So let me share my screen. Colors. And do this way. So let's have choose color, shall we? So it launches an app then for you. I'm not sure. Can you see that this is pop up on your screen or do I have to like share? I probably have to share this separately. I can't see the output. You probably get it now. There so we you go. Get this kind of, you get this kind of thing. So you can get a look look at kind of different. You can choose wow. using colors and luminances, and it will let you uh, download 
You can pick a color from this and we'll download it and put it into your palette for you. That's what color space does. Um, uh, and actually, now we're talking to people who care about colors and they, they, they walk around taking photographs of things. Oh, that's a nice color. You take a photograph and you can take that, you could then use that photograph to figure out what exactly what that color is. Uh, and there's a cheat sheet, uh, which you can you click on that, you'll, there's the color cheat sheet, which is all kind of worth, worth looking through. Oh, I have a problem. Yes, I have a little challenge for you guys. So a couple of questions. <clears throat> Looking at these palettes right here, these are these are from our color brewer. Uh, which one of these guys are diverging palettes? So you have to click on, that's a multiple kind of choice over here. You click on these different guys and then submit your answer. So remember a uh, diverging palettes are ones which are, um, which are like go from hot to cold. And then the next question is, the Wes Anderson palettes. So if you want to look, for example, at the ZZ1 palette, if you run that code right there, it should give you a picture of what it looks like. So it's kind of, it's kind of reds and yellows and, uh, and blues. So which one of the these kind of palettes, if you replace ZZ1 by Moonrise 2, for example, you get to see the Moonrise 2 palette. So, no, you shouldn't have done that. Actually, I think that's the actual answer. You get the idea. So you can kind of check out the different palettes to see can exactly how they, um, uh, to see how they work and see which one corresponds to the little kind of map graphic you have above. So there are a few questions right there for, for this one. I'll, I'll give you guys a, a, a second to answer that. So which are our, which are the diverging palettes? Well, brown, blue, green certainly is. Again, it kind of goes from brown to one end, then to neutral and then fades out. Spectral, kind of looks like it might be, doesn't it? Are these like more, are these kind of more kind of qualitative palette? Uh, oranges, it looks like it's a uh, divert, it's a sequential palette. Set two certainly is categorical, and red purple would be a um, sequential one as well. Let's see what spectral. Yeah, spectral is two. So there are the two ones which are diverging, and the, the other four then are, are either qualitative or um, sequential. And for Wes Anderson, as we're saying, I think it's the moon rise. Yeah. We can see the other ones as well. We can see like the, the, the range of different palettes it has from, um, they choose great names as well. <clears throat> right then, colors have names. So we have, you know, reds and greens and blues and cyans and violet reds and thistles. If you want to see what they are in R, uh, maybe I should share my desktop. So if you want to see what colors are and are, you just go colors. And there are something like 600 of them. They're called like Cadet Blues and Bisque Twos and Burley Wood Ones and so on. Uh, there's a whole bunch of grays in there. Um, they are all our colors. Um, and they come with in base R, so it, whenever you have R, you have those in place. Uh, and they're given by names. A close way of describing colors are by their hex codes. These things here, this talks about a color. So a color is made up of, uh, the way it works on a screen is that, that every point of your screen is sending out a packet of red light, a packet of blue light, and a packet of green light. Uh, it's an, an RGB sequence. And depending what those values are, uh, they're numbers which are sent out and if it's zero, there's no, there's, it's, it's, it's darkness. And if it is two, five, five, it's maximum. That's the way that screens work. Uh, so if you send out zero, 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 
no light is coming out, you get black. If you send out 255, 255, 255, it is setting up the maximum from red, green, and blue, so therefore you get white. If you send out 25500, 0, 0, you're just sending out red light, it'll be bright red. So that's the way the kind of colors work. That's the, the way we kind of we, we break them down. And to describe that, we often use hex codes. So that right there is a hex code. And the way it works is that the first two digits here, that F4, um, that's a number. Um, and it corresponds to a uh, uh, the amount of red. And because the F kind of is so these are those two digits. Like normally when we have two digits, we can go like zero, one, two, three, four up to 99. Uh, but remember our number goes far two, five, five. So what happens is the first digit kind of goes one, two, three to nine, then it goes A, B, C, D, E, F. And that gets you, that gets you as far as 15. Uh, and after 15, you go, um, you go back to zero again. So uh, zero, one, zero, two, zero, nine, zero, A, zero, uh, uh, zero B, zero E, zero F, and then you go one zero, one one, one two, one nine, one A, one B, one F, and so on. So you're, you're working at like a base 16 essentially. So F4 would be a very bright color um, because F kind of is like, you know, it's like being 99 thing. It's a very bright color. Nine three will be weaker and four zero be weaker again. So the, that color right there will have lots of red, um, a medium amount of green, and not that much blue. We can actually have a look at this. Let's see what that color looks like. So if we have a look at R again. Uh, our scales package, our favorite package, has a function called show color. And we give it that string we had a second ago. And it'll print it out. And it looks like this. And it is like, you know, kind of. It's the dominant color here, like the color here is red, but with lots of green and not very much blue. Uh, our next color, what do you think he looks like? Four zero F9, F9. That means not that much red, but a lot of green and a lot of blue. So put green and blue together, what do we get? Got a yellow, right? You got a yellow. Oh, sorry, the same one again. Control C. Kind of bluish yellow. Green and blue like that. Hmm. Well, not yellow at all, in fact. <laughs> not really, yeah. I wonder if we went, ex we've gone extreme on this one. I got rid of all the red. Not that different. Seems to like the blues. So you get an endless fun playing, playing out different colors this way. That's blue. Yeah, okay, there's some green in there. Something has changed, but not very yellow. Um, and so on across the list. Uh, so that's one way, that's hex codes. And with this, like with our colors palette, we have maybe 600 different colors. With our hex codes, we get uh, 255 by 255 by 255, which is 64,000 different colors. So it can have a much finer control of what our color value should be. Or we can do it directly, so RGB values. So here we have amount of R, amount of, uh, amount of green, amount of, amount of blue, explicitly light like this. So we don't have to worry about hex codes anymore. Um, <clears throat> and then HCL values. This is hue, uh, chroma, hue, chroma, and luminance. So they kind of, the thing is, uh, our eyes aren't good at seeing, picking out red, greens, and blues. We're much better kind of picking out things which are given like a spectral, like the hue kind of gives us the spectral value, like, like across a rainbow, for example. And then the, the chroma tells us about how saturated they are, how intense they are. And the luminance gives us how bright they are. So they're three separate things. And they kind of, again, they tell the same story as RGB. Um, but once you get your head around this, it's a far easier to appreciate what the color should look like. 
when you have HDL values. So a lot of people use them. So colors can have a name, they can have a hex code, they can have an RGB value, or they can have an HDL value. And they all tell the same story about, about colors. Uh, let's see our R colors. So this kind of just takes the, if, that takes our colors we had a moment ago. And takes the first batch of them. So the first one's white and Alice blues and uh, antique white and so on. And it's kind of presenting a slice through these guys uh, of our different colors. Right then. Oh, we talked about show color a second ago. Um, it can work with the hex colors or it can work with the actual name where is red. Okay, and so on down the list. Um, the RGB function will give you a hex code for fractured red, green, blue. So let's take this guy and put him in place. And it gives us this. Does that kind of make sense? Well, 0.4, it's kind of a, a moderate level of red, not that much green and more blue. So moderate red, not that much green, more blue. It kind of makes sense. Right then. Now, um, more kind of things to get to get nice colors. There's color picker is again, it opens up an app. Um, uh, so it'll give you, it'll ask you to send back, it'll, you click on a palette and it'll send back four different colors. Actually, let's, let's put that in place. Again, these are all packages that you that don't come with base or you have to put them in place. So let's pick a color. So you give it a little palette like this. Let's pick ourselves a nice blue color. There it is. And you can select that uh, somewhere. And then the second one's gonna be maybe that kind of reddish color. And then the third one will take, uh, let's see what yellow is actually, seeing as we're it's a pretty bright yellow right there at the top corner. E6FA0A. Hmm. It's got lots of red in there too. That, that yellow color's got lots of red in there. And let's see, get the orange. So there are four colors. We need to press on. It sends them back to R. So you get this kind of palette of, of, of colors right there. You can lift and use them within your, within your, uh, within your code to give that palette. Okay, uh, color finder right there at the bottom. He's quite nice because with him, you give him an image and from that image, he works out what the color it contains. So like, for example, he gives this picture of the Simpsons uh, and asks for five color for six colors, it'll send back these guys. Uh, it looks at the image and send back the most popular pixels there. So it actually avoids it. You look at it, there's lots of yellow here, but actually, the different grades of yellow, so it doesn't kind of pass muster. Whereas the, the side of this TV sets all the same color, so he gets uh, sent back. These pinks get sent back because again they're all the same color. Whereas the faces have grades of uh, of different yellow uh, for the complexion of our, our characters, so they don't get they don't make the first, they don't make the top six. That's what Color Finder does. <clears throat> um, and then there's lots of kind of ways to find different palettes, cooler.co, color picker, we saw a second ago, color space. They all do the same kind of thing of being able to take it, to be able to choose colors and to find out different hex codes based on, based on what you select. And the eyedropper tool, uh, if you can see that right up there uh, on my Chrome browser is the eyedropper tool. And what he does is when you go to, when you click on him, he'll ask you to select a color, okay. Uh, from your web page, if you're looking at an image, for example, uh, pick from web page. If I put it right there, oh, I want to give you an image. It'll kind of from that picture, it'll get it'll select kind of a, it'll set the color from you. I wonder we'll work in our Simpsons.
So it sent back the color out there and it should give me, yeah, you can see up in that corner right there, there's the color and it's giving you the, a name for that color, it's called Sienna. And it's giving the hex code and the HSL and the RGB values. <clears throat> so it's a neat way, he found like a, a nice picture on the web. So there's a nice way to be able to uh, choose out that color and find out what his hex, color, hex values are. <coughs> um, so a uh, little kind of task for you guys. Uh, I want you to display the nine colors from, from the magma palette from Virtus. So we're gonna, to get those colors, we're gonna go, uh, Veritas is the package and then magma, gonna type that in. Okay, and it'll give you hints for that as well if you'd like to. Okay, so over to you guys. Display them and then there's a second question about using show call. Oh, actually, first of all, there's hex codes. Um, so you're asked to get the RGB values for these different colors. So you're given these commands from the gplot in the library, color to hex and color to RGB. And you give them the name of the color right there and it should send you back what the value is. So let's just do the first one together. Uh, let's take, let's take, so we do something like this. And we go maybe red. And then run our code. Oh, sorry, that package must not be there. My apologies. I didn't. I mustn't have put it, included this in the in the app. My apologies. So this one this is not going to work, I'm afraid. Uh, unless you want to run this like on your local, if we take this and run it on a local machine. I always spelled this wrong. It's G plots. So there should be an S here at the end. And now it works. Say, so it's G plot rather than G plot. So there's a typo right there. <clears throat> um, and that gives us the hex code for red, which is like, you know, lots of red, no blue, no green. Okay, so up you guys, you can do the same thing then for the different color we have in place over, uh, up top. And then to find the hex code for that color right there and click on the red button. I'll give you guys a minute for that.
Um, so you can get like lot, there's lots of different kind of pellets in the <coughs> pellets in the brewer pellet stable. Um, <coughs> we're asked to pick one which is a diverging pellet. So these are qualitative ones, sequential ones, and there's some diverging ones. Uh, so let's go for PIYG. That's our red, yellow, blue we have at the moment, but let's go for P I Y G. Eugene, I can't seem to get the call to RGB to work. Yeah, it doesn't work for me either. Uh, call to RGB. So the call to hex does work, yeah? Yeah, that one works. Yeah. I wonder, is it not in G-plots? It's not in G-plots. It's actually in base R. Uh -huh. we, don't, we don't need the G-plots at the beginning for that one. Yeah, let's work on this app. What yellow looks like. Yellow is red and green. Hmm. Cornflower blue. I mean, you expect to be a bluish color. So it'd be like high and blue and not much else. So of these guys, I would guess him. No, I'm wrong. It's the top one. It's got lots of, it's got a fair bit of red, a bit more green and lots of blue. Uh, for gray 87, like it's gonna be a gray color that's gonna have the same value for everything. Uh, maybe that right there. Certainly not, not the top or bottom ones because they have different amounts of, like 60, 60, 66 of the same amount of red, green, and blue. I like has this one, and yeah, I happen to be right. Okay, moving onwards. <clears throat> so now we have our colors, how are we gonna go to use them? We kind of seen this already. Uh, we've seen we can use like fill and color, we'll kind of, we'll launch our kind of our, our color viewer with NGG plot. They'll, expect us to change their color of different things depending on different aesthetics. But then we can use, we have a layer then of scale fill or scale color to actually control this. And there are lots of different scale color functions or scale fill functions, but they tend to kind of go in parallel. Um, so if we looked at this, if we go scale fill, all of a sudden, if you type that in, there's scale field bend, diverging, divergent X, qualitative. These are all functions which do the very similar thing of assigning kind of different colors depending on uh, different palettes. Uh, here we have the Virtus palettes coming in place. Um, these guys are the Brewer palettes as well in there someplace. So they will all kind of have different uh, layers of mapping colors onto um, onto the different kind of aesthetics that we have chosen. So that all the all the layers scale fill something will do that for us. Uh, let's see what an impact this had. Let's see, we've got a picture over here. We have uh, again our Gapminder data set, and we're having average fertility as a function of year for different continents. And our first palette we have here is a qualitative palette uh, from the Brewer package. And we can see we have like, you know, uh, greens and blues and pinks and the freaking light kind of light color here for Europe uh, for different fertilities. That's a, that's a scale of brewer, brewer package. 
uh, that's a this is a qualitative one, which is remember these are categorical distinct ones, and that will be the right choice for this case. But if we chose a diverging palette, we end up with these colors. So this is kind of um, it kind of goes obviously from a blue color to a brown color. This would be the neutral in between, uh, and picks out our contents that way. Uh, then in Veritas, the ones which are good for um, color vision, we have uh, again a different suite of colors. Uh, these will be that D means is discrete, so these are categorical <coughs> palettes right there, as different as they possibly can. Uh, now we're using Palettier. Um, we're using the Andy Warhol pack um, from Artiste. So this is using our Palettier, which kind of looks at all your different kind of um, all your available pa palettes and picks out the one from the package Artiste based on Andy Warhol. And here we there it goes. There are different colors we get there. Uh, the Irish flags, why not? So the map palettes uh, package, and there'll be different kind of, we should have got a well flag here if you'd like to, um, they'll pick out different colors in play. Um, yeah, the R package um, has South Park. So these are color, colors which you associate with the um, series South Park. Uh, Again, another kind of uh, Dutch Masters is another kind of package with, with palettes in it. And these are the pearl earrings. So this is a, uh, again, kind of based on a painting, uh, a duty of Delft. And again, if you go and look at these paintings, you'll see that indeed these are the kind of colors we see with it, uh, in there. Uh, I'm not sure what Ghibli is. And the cake you like. It's like the Japanese equivalent of Disney. I think it is, yes. Uh, Beautiful art, isn't it? The coconut palette, passion fruit palette. Uh, this is from a scientific publication, The Lancet. Uh, this is from the University of, University of Chicago. Uh, oh, and this is from Star Trek. So there's a lot of different choices. In each case, you'll see you know, that there's changes in our color display. And you can, you can scroll, so you, you can kind of change them, and you can quite easily jump from one to the next to see like what color scheme works best for your particular graphic. <clears throat> There's that's uh, that's all done with uh, using a scale color. Uh, we also have scale fill. Um, so here we've done a, a histogram, and histogram remember has solid blocks that we, we use. If we want the outline of the blocks, we'd use scale color. Uh, but we want to have the the core of the uh, of these boxes, so we use scale fill. And there's a British pack, Veritas package right there. It's continuous, so it kind of goes from. Uh, uh, a blue at one end to yellow at the next. And then we have, all right then, this is changed then. So this is uh, overwritten the, 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 the Verdes um, palette with a scale fill gradient to. <coughs> now what this does, it is a um, diverging palette. Uh, so gradient two will give you a diverging palette where at one end you choose dark green at the other end, you have fabric force. This is like a greenish color. This is a red color. And then the midpoint will be white. And that'll happen at 65. So life expectancies, um, this is like roughly speaking the, that's midpoint of roughly speaking the, the, the median life expectancy for our data set. And if you have a lower life expectancy, you go green. And if you're a higher life expectancy, you go kind of reddish. And you get this kind of picture over here. So that scale code gradient two does that. Uh, it's important to pick the midpoint because otherwise it just sets zero and there would be like, this would be kind of white and they would all be kind of getting more and more kind of reddish as you go across and you'd forget about anything which is in green. So it's important to set the mid midpoint that corresponds to our neutral color. Could you set midpoint equals uh, count max? So the highest peak would be the because that's the highest count. So should that not be the mid? Oh, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, we could do that. Just a thought, yeah. I guess so we have our, we'd have our white color over here. We'd have anything below that, 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 um, uh, that figure would be, uh, yep, yeah, that'd be a very good point. Cool. OK, that's it for colors. <clears throat> now into faceting. We saw this kind of, do you remember our first one we did together with the, with the penguins? We made our graphic and so on, blah, 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 blah. And at the very end, we split them into like, uh, into by, by gender, by, uh, by male and female. That's called faceting. 
and it takes a plot and it breaks it into subplots based on some criteria. So to do that, the major kind of carriers for this are facet wrap and facet grid. <coughs> and what facet wrap does is it takes, say you have 10 categories, it'll just line them up uh, in no, well, in an order, but it'll line them up kind of uh, in kind of some kind of grid across your page. Um, so that's what facet wrap does. It's, it takes one kind of, it takes one kind of um, one variable and splits it out based on that variable. Uh, and uh, it'll, if you have, if you have nine categories, it'll probably do a three by three. If you've got 12 categories, it'll do like a four by three. If you have eight categories, it'll probably do a four by two um, and so on. Uh, and just like kind of wraps around the page. Facet grid on the other hand, what it does is if you want to facet by more than one, uh, by more than one variable. So again, going back to our penguins, uh, we had like a nice kind of picture of the different kind of uh, dimensions of penguins for the different species. And we split them out based on sex. We could also split them out based on the island. Remember there are three different islands. So maybe kind of female penguins, female genti penguins on this island are bigger than female penguins on that island. So it'll have different kind of, it'll have uh, male and female, but then it'll have the three different islands in place, um, so Tar Targinson, Dream and something else. Uh, along kind of the, the y direction. So facet grid gives you like a way of doing it by x and by y. Right then, so name sex. So here we have our kid developed uh, a cat's data set, which has um, body weight and height, I think. And that's produces our axes. This is our points for on our graph. And GeoSmooth, we haven't met before. What GeoSmooth does is it'll kind of fit through our data. <clears throat> um, and uh, it's done it by based on sex. So this, by giving it the, giving this, the aesthetic, we don't have to do this, but by giving it the aesthetic sex within the GeoSmooth, it'll do one line for, for, um, for females and one line for males. Uh, and then we split them across, we split them apart. So here we have kind of females on one side uh, and we have males on the other. So this facet grid does that. And the syntax for it is that little kind of uh, um, uh, diddly bob there, uh, followed by the actual um, aesthetic we need. And then uh, this again, this labeler thing, we don't need him, but just rather than having M and F, uh, we're gonna go for female and male. If we didn't have that labor in place, um, it would just have M and F rather than male and female. It's body weight and it's heart weight, sorry, not height. So I can see bigger, bigger cats have bigger hearts and male cats tend to be bigger than female cats. Oh, and then we kind of get rid of some stuff. And then we do some seating stuff. We'll, we'll talk about teams like in our after coffee. <clears throat> right, then, that's that. That was our cat's plot. Now, uh, this is quite nice. We're taking a data, data set from the movies, and it looks at it looks at movies again. This is from um, from the Box Office Mojo library, and takes movies and it gets the ratings for different movies. So they're kind of rated based on from 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 zero to five, based on how good they are. And this is the overall kind of. Again, remember our stat density, position identity, geom line. I'm not sure what just three is all about. Oh yeah, just three. So that's how much smoothing there is. Uh, if you didn't have that, if you just, normally we have just one, this would be quite spiky because ratings are either one or two or three or four or five, didn't have a 1.5. So that just three gives you more smoothing. So it kind of, it's a more representative of what we should have. And this here for all movies, you see that there's not many ratings of one, there's more of two. Lots of three, even more of four, and not that many fives. That's for all the movies. But now we do have a kind of facet wrap. So this is a facet wrap. And again, we have our syntax, a little dot, followed by our citadella, and then genre. So our movie database uh, has the ratings of different movies and also documents uh, what type they are, um, whether they're action, adventure, animation, so on, children's, and so on. 
uh, so and strip position. So this strip position means that we now put the label beneath. So in our other, in our last example, we had females and males on top of our pictures. Now we put them, now we put them underneath. So that's what our strip position does. These things are called the strip, the label for each facet. And we don't need this density stuff on the, on the left-hand side, nor the, the, the ratings can all speak to themselves. So get rid of them, and that's our picture. Uh, and for our movies, if we look at this, um, looking across the board, action gets lots of ratings. Well, action kind of gets um, a bit of everything. Likewise, comedy. <coughs> Musicals are kind of more vanilla because you know no one hates them, no one likes them too much. Uh, likewise, documentaries. Crime kind of is, uh, is, is very highly rating and so on across the board. Likewise, mystery is really highly rating. So kind of we can kind of pick out like how different different kind of film genres are regarded based on a plot like that. Okay, and I'll ask if we have our snails data set. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Sorry if I missed it. Um, on the previous slide, you got those um, element blanks in the axis titles. Yeah. Sorry, did you explain what they were? Oh, I didn't and I should. So looking at this, all the stuff on the, this axis, the density plot, that doesn't tell us anything. Uh, it's not that interesting. And likewise, the ratings over here at the very bottom don't care about them too much either. So you want to have this as you want to have this as stripped down as possible to keep our message. So what these guys are doing is they're removing them. So the x axis text, text y is the axis text y is ah uh, okay these numbers 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. That's the axis text Y, that's gone. Axis text X, or these numbers across the bottom, that's gone too. <clears throat> uh, axis title Y was, it said density there. Yeah, yeah. Get rid of that. And axis title X is the, the rating part of the right bottom. Get rid of that too. We'd have to have a good title on this. We'd have Thank to have some kind of plot title talking about you know movie ratings, not to five. Yeah. Um, so we captured that. Um, again, themes are something we're going to talk about after our break. Uh, they'll be a feature for our next conversation, but it's kind of nice to talk about here as well. Okay, great. <coughs> snails. Um, snails data set. Scientific measures. You've got different species of snails. Like there are just two of them. Uh, and the, you have the... Um, uh, what else do you do? So you take a batch of snails. Uh, of different species, uh, you leave them for several weeks at different relative humidities and different temperatures, and you see how long they survive. So that's our snails data set. And if we just do it like this, it kind of looks pretty ugly, it doesn't tell us anything at all. But when we facet grid this, what we have is, these are the number of deaths of our snails, in other words, how, how dramatic these conditions are. Um, these are weeks of exposure. This is um, species A and species B. And you can see kind of then we have our different uh, temperatures, 10 degrees Celsius, 15 and 20 degrees Celsius. And here we have different humidities. So for sp species A right there on top, at 10 degrees Celsius, when it's quite dry, 60 means it's quite dry, that we have lots of kind of, uh, we lose lots of snails. Whereas as it gets more and more moist, to get a higher chance of survival. Uh, and as the temperature gets higher, we tend to, again, when it's dry, we tend to lose lots of snails, but also kind of um, for more moist conditions, we also tend to lose lots of snails. So we kind of see this picture over here. And then we contrast the species A with species B. This is a facet grid. So we have species on our y-axis as a function of temperature on our x-axis. And this little, 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 little thing in the middle kind of means that we have that. So in our previous one, we had, we only had a, in our previous example, when we did a facet wrap, we had to go dot genre like this, because there's nothing kind of, you know, there's nothing going on on the y-axis. They're all kind of like just, just lined up. Whereas with a facet grid, we need to have, we now have 
swimming on the y-axis, we separate up and down by species, and then we switch this bus across by temperature. And that gives us faster grit. Is there a reason that you do those the other way around than you do like box uh, bar charts? It's the darndest thing um, that you GD plots one of the older packages at NR. It goes back, it must go back 10 years or so. Uh, and if we were to do ggplot again, we'd do it quite differently. So lots of its syntax kind of is uh, was of its time. And that kind of format there are going y as a function of x. That kind of was a decision made earlier on. If we had it again, we would do it differently. We'd go explicitly facet grid, x equals blah, blah, y equals blah, blah. We do it that way. Um, but okay. because, it's gonna, because it's there now, it's, it's hard to, to, to rewind the clock on that. Um, there are quite a few things in, few things in ggplot which are uh, like legacy kind of features, which we're stuck with. Um, but we, if we had life again, we would do it differently. Uh, okay. Like, for example, um, See the way we have the pipe here, we take snails and send that into ggplot, and then ggplot works its magic. But between each layer, we have a plus sign like that. Yeah. If we could do it again, we would replace that with a pipe. We have the same kind of symbol from that from, from like you know, we treat that the data as being one layer, and every part of ggplot will be the next layer on top of that. We'd have a pipe from each one. Uh, and often there are some new packages, like for example, with mapping to do it that way. Uh, if we had it again, we'd have this aesthetics kind of feature is kind of clunky and a bit kind of awkward having it that way. Uh, and again, for modern packages, I'm thinking about, for example, there's one doing mapping called, um, called leaflet. Uh, instead of having aesthetics explicitly this way, they would have exposure with the civil in front of it. So if you're an aesthetic, you're we were preceded by, by this kind of curly line thing, that, whatever that's, what is that called? Tilde, I think. Tilde, thank you. There's a tilde in front of it. I prefer to If it is a, if it is an attribute, there's no tilde. Okay. Uh, and it's much cleaner and much kind of more straightforward. So that, again, you're right. This thing over here, if we had it again, we'd have y equals species, x equals temperature, and leave it at that. But it's kind of a legacy feature of, of, um, of the plot. So it's just something to bear in mind when you're doing. Classic. I know, I know. There's a lot of like, there's, you get to use a lot of your keyboard when you're doing kind of coding with ggplot, right? If Python's the same. So, uh, and there are some things which are just, you just have to know. Uh, and this is why Google is your best friend often when you're doing these things, because it's impossible to, they're not, they're not consistent across all libraries. So, so, so you just got to look them up. Okay. Would it be the same for facet wrap then as well? Y then X. Well, I think fast drop, fast drop just works with the Y. Oh, okay. Or, sorry, with the next, like fast drop just gives you a line and then when it gets to the end of line, it'll cut to, cut to the next one. It doesn't separate them out that way. So I think it just takes one kind of, it just takes one aesthetic and splits on it. Whereas fast grid okay. gives you the potential to have two. Okay. So I'm pretty sure the fast, if you give that to fast drop, it would, it would crash. Oh. Let me try and sneak. So I need the math library. So that works for my snails that way. But if we replace faster grid by faster wrap, my guess is that this will crash. I hope I'm wrong. But... No, it works too. I'll be darned. Okay. I always thought fast draft just, just one dimension. So yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Oh, good to know. Louis. Good to know. Okay. We're gonna finish the section with a little problem. So we have Gapminder facets. We have that plot right there. And I'm gonna ask you guys to reproduce that. And you're given the starting part right there. Oh, hang on. Start over. Actually, there's a whole bunch of problems over here. So penguin plots, US arrests, and to produce some facets. 
Shall we do maybe the first one of these guys? Let's do the penguin plot and leave the other ones for your, for your, uh, to, to tackle at your leisure. So I'll work on penguin plot right now and see how you get on. Any success? And quite a lot to do in this problem because you have to pick colors as well.
you might get something like that for a plot. I'm struggling to get it. Like, I don't know how to get it to look for colors in that stowers package. Or... Let me check and see. So there's this chart here. Yeah, I'm not sure where, where we're supposed to go for that. Is there a quicker way than doing it than um, like manually checking for the hex codes? Putting them in. Um, how do you mean? Well, on the, on the hint that you've got for the color scale color manual, you've yeah. got um, scale color manual of brackets values equals C, and then you've uh, got the hex codes listed. Is yeah. there a quicker way of using a package that would just like to get around having to manually choose three colors? Well, I, I guess we could use like Google scale color Veritas and pick three values from there. Okay. And it'll kind of, it'll go to the, it'll use like a Veritas palette and, and bring that out for us. Uh, so we can kind of use like a default palette from someplace else and work with him. Um, but scale color manual kind of requires you to have like well-known colors as it is. <clears throat> like often what, what people have is like if you're doing like a series of graphics, you have a like a, a, an array, like a sequence of different colors and you can of hex codes you just that you work with and you pick from them. Um, I just picked DC around them more or less. Let me see, I want to look at palette here.
is there a way to just to do oh wait maybe I've done it wrong. Remember you asked me about Palatier. It looks actually, if you install the Palatier library, it looks like it does come up pellets that it, it has from elsewhere, but it does come with some pellets. Oh, cool. So when you when you install Palatier, it kind of it will bring in other packages as well and the corresponding packages, corresponding palettes. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm done. Excellent. So I'm going to charge up our our last set of slides are on themes. Okay, so fonts and themes. Uh, so fonts are a choice of writing or script we can use within our within ggplot, um, and then themes are the overall look and feel of all your of your graphics. So let's talk about fonts first of all. Uh, so when you look at fonts, they come. Hmm, so, so fonts kind of are, if you look at most text, it's written in quite kind of sterile fonts, uh, like Arial Career. They're kind of quite legible, but they're not that exciting. Uh, and it's often worthwhile to have fonts which maybe kind of convey more of individuality and more, I know, kind of set the tone for what you want to produce. So fonts are important that way. And there was a time when we had like low resolution screens and low resolution printers, and it was kind of difficult to choose a font which would come across well because of the which you were working with. But that's not the case anymore. Um, so there are lots and lots of fonts out there and let's not be afraid to experiment and try different ones. Um, in some ways, I mean, font, it's a whole world, it's a subculture in itself, fonts, uh, and has been for a long time. If you go back to typesetting and the, 19th century, um, it was it was the age of fonts, and there was a huge amount of work being done in in, in typography and different way of lettering, and uh, it was an art form. And then we kind of we went through a period whereby, like we're saying, we didn't have we couldn't afford to have complicated lettering, and and we didn't. Um, but that's kind of we're emerging from that now, and we have access to some some ways of kind of writing our text, which is kind of the way it should be, kind of more artistic. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to point you in two different directions. First of all, practicaltopography.com is a web, it's a book actually online, um, which is, talks about the history and the structure of, um, of lettering. And unless you've looked at it, you'll, you'll, you've no idea how kind of complicated and involved is that this topic is. Uh, uh, so that's kind of that's nice to have a look at that kind of, um, that source. And as well, there is a, talk by Will Chase at the RCU conference last year, which I'm gonna, I think I mentioned before, I'm gonna mention it right now again. And it's a, uh, it's a 20 minute talk, which is kind of worth checking out. And actually some of this, this stuff I'm gonna show you right now is lifted from his presentation. So just in case you're wondering, um, your font does matter. It is part of the message. 
um, depending how you write things, kind of sends a different rate of message. Uh, so it can be quite engaging, it can be quite threatening. Uh, it also <clears throat> leaves you kind of open to uh, misinterpretation, depending how you write things. So if your video store is called this, just careful how you write the word. Oh dear. Uh, likewise, um, that should say my favorite color is glitter. Uh, it doesn't quite get, doesn't quite get there. Uh, and that should be kickboxing, um, but not so much. So be careful what lettering you use to, to, to make sure we don't get, uh, get things badly wrong. Um, so we're gonna look at some text right here now. Uh, here's a little plot of <clears throat> from uh, our mammals sleep data set. We have brain weight against body weight. Uh, and just looking at, looking at the text we have over here, it's quite legible, but it's kind of more striking. It kind of stands out more from the rest of our page because of its because of its song choice. Uh, I think I'm that dot in the top right. Pardon? The dot in the top right. That's me. <laughs> the large brain. That's right. Uh, I think it makes you. I think it makes you blue whale. <laughs> uh, on that. Um, so. For getting fonts, I'm gonna mention two packages. One's called ShowText, uh, and ShowText is produced originally to get like lots of um, Asian fonts in place and does that very well. But also kind of covers fonts across the board. And there's also a package called um, Extra Font, um, which is trickier to work with, but kind of works too. And if you want to look at fonts, let's kind of just kind of pull up a web page. Let's pick up the uh, the Google Fonts page. Uh, and they have a, a vast array of different fonts and they come in different categories. So there's serif, sans serif. Let's look at serif fonts first of all. What serif means is if you look at a, if you look at a font, um, a serif font means, look at the lettering. These little clicks here, these do hickeys at the corners. That little at the bottom of the B or kind of like at the top of the A right there or at the top of the A over here. They're called serifs. And they're like, they're decorations. Um, but a serif font will have them. Whereas a sans serif font and the ones we were stuck with for a long time, uh, they'll be absent. So if we look at this font and zoom in on him, again, they've gone now. So the letters kind of well, there's a little stuff on the B over here, but there's far less decoration on a, on a on a sans serif font than there is on a serif font. So those little doohickeys, the serifs, have been kind of removed. Uh, then we have display fonts right there. Again, they're getting more complicated. There's more kind of features. There's more happening. Or we get handwriting fonts, which look like this, which kind of are like they suggest handwriting. And then there are monospace fonts, which means there's a whole thing about lettering is how much space each letter should, should, should get. So some letters, for example, like an I is quite thin, uh, like an N is much, or like a W is much larger, but a monospace font spreads them out the, the same, all out the same way. So they line up on top of each other. And you'll see that over here, for example, in this text, A, W, H, and G are all on top of each other. L, E, A, and R on top of each other. M, space, K, and O are on top of each other. Whereas we go for a more complicated font, that might not be the case anymore. So there's a bit of these, these letters over here, there's kind of a curve right there because they're not lining up so much anymore because they're not evenly spaced out. Thin letters like an I get far less space and like broad letters like, 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 like a W. So there's a whole kind of thing going on here with fonts. These are the Google fonts. Uh, and there's a lot of them <coughs> and a lot of them and a lot of them and they all have names. Uh, and they all have a download button. So you can take that font and it'll download a zip file for you and put it onto your machine. And it gives you, uh, amongst other things, a file called a .ttf, a two type font. And when you double click on that, it'll put it onto your system. You can use it. If, and if it's in there properly, you can use it in any, any kind of process you want, any kind of, any kind of uh, program you want. Are these all royalty free or do the license change depending on each font? <clears throat> These are free. 
Uh, there are fonts you have to pay for, um, but these ones are free. Uh, so Google Fonts, that's, I guess that's their, 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 their gift to the community is that they, they provide these fonts for free. Um, where was I? Okay, so they're all fonts. Now, if you want to use them, uh, you can download them and harness them that way. Uh, but it's actually often easier to keep them in Google and then access them when you need them. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, you're not downloading fonts the whole time. And also makes your stuff more portable. So you're not relying on a local installation or local font to, to run your program to get your graphic. Um, kind of, it's just kind of nice. Um, and uh, so that's what font add Google does. Um, what was I going to say right there now? Skip my mind, I'm sorry. Um, so this is always in the library to the show text library and the font add Google function. In that function, you give it two things. First of all, the name of the font. Okay, right there. And that has to be correspond to the name within Google fonts. So let's look at covered by your grace. Let's look for that guy. Uh, can search for fonts here someplace. It's not at this. There it is. It's a handwriting font. So that's what it looks like, covered by your grace. Um, and then if we want to get that font, we give it the name, which comes with the name from the Google, and then we're just going to call it Grace. So like, Rod, we, we could type whatever we want inside of here, um, but then, you know, Grace seems to make about sense. Um, not too lot to type and kind of fairly clear. So that's what we're going to call it when we use it. This font that Google does some downloading for you, so it can take a while. So uh, uh, we have some problems later on this, and you'll, you might notice that the, that the when we run our code, it takes a bit longer, it takes like a minute or so because we are downloading stuff from Google. And then we need to put the show text auto because we need to put that in place. That actually makes our font that we download discoverable by our process. So after downloading it, after every time we call font.google, we have to run show text, show text auto. Or we can have several downloads and before we use them, we got to run show text auto and that puts them in play. And then when we want to change our font, we have this theme here. So this kind of, this theme text, text element text, will set all of our text within our graphic into the font grace. So that's kind of what we have over here. Cool. So that's kind of working with fonts. If you, sorry, Eugene, yeah. if, can you go back one slide? Um, could you set that so that, um, for example, the title was a different font to the uh, the axes. So yes. Yes. So uh, this does all text within the, the, the within our um, within our, our graphic, but we could go um, title dot text equals element family something, okay. and as long as we do that afterwards, that'll kind of uh, we could first of all set all text equal to grace, and then it'll if we do it afterwards we have theme title text. That'll set the title text to a different font as well. So that would be very well to choose. So yeah, we can do that. Um, it is, however, it's okay to have maybe two fonts in a graphic. When you go beyond that, it kind of gets a bit frou frou. So um, when you start when you start kind of like wondering about the fonts, then you might have gone too far. So I think having two is good. Having three, kind of, you need, you need to have a good reason to have more than two. But yeah, it's eminently possible to, to do like we can uh, to, to, to change in different elements to different uh, different font settings. <coughs> uh, here's some font sources. So there's fonts like Google, of course, there's font squirrel and the 1001 free fonts, and there's far more where that came from. So there's a lot of kind of fonts out there. That's when the font at Google does some downloading for you and takes some time. Uh, you don't have to do it that way. Uh, Again, within show text, there's just font add. 
that won't go searching for Google for you. It'll go searching on your local machine, but you got to tell where to find the font. So here we kind of, uh, again, we kind of, we give it whatever name we want to here. It's a very similar process, but now we have to give it the location of a file we've downloaded already. And again, note that these are .ttfs, these are two type font directories. And again, having done that, we need to run show text also to make them kind of put them, put them within our system that we can actually use, use them within our graphics. <coughs> and these guys, so that means as well, also that if you have using font ad, you've got access to all these other guys, not just fonts Google. Um, there is a way, there's a way of running, of getting it so that you download them, install them, and then you never have to worry about using them again. Uh, so again, using a TTF font file, we put them in place, put them into our system and we launch them and they're, they're, they're available to us ad infinitum as long as we work on that computer. Uh, and that's with the extra fonts package. However, I, I, I always struggle, I always struggle with it. Uh, I'm always kind of clicking things until they work. Uh, you can see what fonts you can use with view font table. Uh, and that brings up, let's see that. So if we work in view font table, oh, I'll need extra font. It brings up all available fonts like this. So there, there are names right there, Courier, Deja Vu, Free, uh, Georgia, Georgia Bold, and so on. Uh, I can only see your um, uh, oh, sorry. browser. I'll share the screen instead, my apologies. Is that it there now? Yeah, I can see it, thank you. Cool. So these are all the fonts available. Um, but I find it, like, like I say, I, I battle with it every time. Um, so extra font more difficult to work with than, um, than, than show text. And what's more, you got to run this TTF import as well, which takes a long time because it goes through your entire system looking for looking for TTF files and putting them in place, and that could take several minutes. <clears throat> and then you have to restart R to make them to actually make them work. But if, you, if it does kind of work, then then you're up and running, and you can have a font which is like put in place in your system, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Every time you you specify that font within the, within a theme, it'll be available for you. <coughs> There's also thematic. Uh, which is a new package, which is designed really for, it's designed for Shiny and app apps and for our Markdown, but it kind of works across the board. And thematic will kind of, uh, thematic will kind of uh, let you set, well, actually it takes care of the pain of um, finding the font and putting it in place and uh, the whole show text auto thing. Uh, it cuts through that, um, so it's perhaps simpler than, than, than the other approaches, but it's new and I haven't used it that much just yet. Oh, so we have a problem for you. We have a problem screen for you guys. Uh, we have a couple of things over here. So if you go to uh, fonts.google.com uh, and look at these following four fonts, which ones are display fonts? So we need to um, go to the, the, the fonts to google.com, look up these guys and see which ones are in this display fonts kind of roster and which ones aren't. And then our second question is, um, so we're asking you guys then to include the, uh, a caveat font and make a little kind of plot with that. So here's a, here's a plot right there. Uh, using um, cholera data. So cholera looks like, so this package looks like this. It's got cholera data from London back in the 19th century and has like, you know, the number, the rate of incidents in cholera in different boroughs of London uh, back in <coughs> 1850 or so. Uh, and then we're doing a plot of population versus number of cholera deaths. And if we just can run that, we get uh, this picture right here. 
but we'd like to change the text of all that around our plot over here, uh, the labels and the legends, et cetera, and the population. We want them to be in a different, uh, uh, a different bond face. So you're going to have to perceive this with putting in place our um, font uh, using font at Google and then show text auto and then kind of have this line at the very end uh, to make it play within our within our diagram. So there are two, there are two posts right there now and I'll give you again maybe five minutes for this and check back on you then. <coughs> How are you getting on? I think I got it. Cool. Yeah, I'm done. Thanks to the hints. <laughs> that's what they're there for. Cool. So we work as bonds now. That's that's pretty neat. Um, 
and that there's a whole world there and they can, they can liven up our graphics very well having having different fonts and having accents of different fonts themes <coughs> themes are the overall shape like we kind of danced around this a little bit so far but themes are the overall shape of our graphics and we have fine control over how we how we display things um so ggplot when it comes you make a, a you make like a routine ggplot uh and it's to be honest not that great uh let me so let's take a let's take a, a routine ggplot let's have our pamper penguins And let's feed that into So when we do that, like we end up with a plot, which is not that great. Uh, a number of things about it are quite annoying. Um, this kind of gray background we talked about before, um, there's no reason why it should be there and it doesn't do much for our plot. Uh, the lettering we have is it's not a great font type and it's also very small. So the default plots within the default system within ggplot really isn't that great and you should always change that. Uh, so we do that with themes. Now, there are some default themes within ggplot. So let's see what different themes do for us. So some of these are like theme classic, for example. If you go to ggplot, uh, you have automatically a theme classic. It's there. Um, or you got a theme black and white, theme dark, theme. These are the ones which are given to us within basic ggplot. Uh, and it's the theme classic is better in that our gray square has gone, okay? Still has our default colors, but, and also, by the way, the default colors in ggplot are pretty terrible as well. This red, the green, the blue, they're just not distinguishable enough. We can see over here, for example, like our greens and our, our blues are, they're hard, because they're overlapping so much, they're hard to tell apart. Not good. Theme dark uh, is like the inverse. Uh, it makes our, like, as we're seeing, like, our panel go, go darker. Theme Excel kind of mimics the, what you get from an Excel plot. Theme Economist uh, is taking the theme from The Economist magazine. Uh, 538, the 538 uh, about American elections uh, and polling data, their kind of uh, default settings. Wall Street Journal right there. So you can see what you can see that there's several changes. The background panel, maybe the most noticeable thing. Note here as well, our legend has gone to the top of our page rather than the right hand side. Um, likewise for the Wall Street Journal. Um, so they have like different themes which are which you can put in play just by having adding this little kind of pit of text, this layer at the end of our plot. Okay. And there's an awful lot of complete themes. Uh, here are some libraries which contain lots of so gg themes gg themer tv themes and so on bb plot the ones from the bbc uh gg tech takes themes from companies like facebook uh twitter etc uh, airbnb uh there's a website link over here which uh, you know is kind of nice to, for our for the rest of us which kind of talks about themes and kind of gives you a picture of what they might look like uh and again like well Mentioned thematic again over here. Uh, so they are complete themes and they can, you can bolt them onto the end of your graphic and they will kind of take the, the, the hallmark of a publication or a site, whatever it is, and put it onto all of your, all of your stuff. That's complete themes. Uh, oh, little thematic example over here we have, uh, it takes this font called permanent marker uh, and some kind of color features and then kind of puts that in place on our on our diagram. You can see it's quite different from uh, from the default theme of ggplot. Okay, so we can do that. Uh, when you're finished, by the way, you have to do thematic off. So when you've you can use that for several plots in a row, but when you're finished, make sure you use that line right there. Otherwise, it'll keep on it'll keep on 
uh, overriding anything you, you put in place. Um, so find control over things. That's kind of for global things and you put, you change everything <clears throat> in one go. But either having done that or else from the get go, you can make each small little feature, you can change each small little one. And we can, we've been doing this like all day uh, without talking about it too much. Um, but if you do a question mark theme on R, you come with this big long page of different features you can change. I'm not sure how visible that is, uh, but you can change lines or rectangles or texts or titles or then the subtext of them. Uh, so within a plot, I'm gonna go back up for a second. Within a plot, there are different things we should talk about. So for example, um, a plot will have a type, this one doesn't. Any plot words have a title? No, anyway. A, a plot might have a title that we put in place, okay? That's called title. Um, this thing over here at the top where it separates out our islands, Bisco, Dream, and Torgensen, that's called a legend. Uh, this blue square is called the panel. These are our axis. That's, these are our X axis um, text. The body mass G is the X axis title. And these little doohickeys there are the X axis ticks. Okay, so they're all kind of, these things all have names uh, and there are an awful lot of them. Uh, and you can see there's a long list that, that comes up if you do a question mark theme uh, and pick through that. Um, if we want to change them, we add this layer uh, or something like it onto the end of our, uh, our code. So this will say, okay, we're working with, work with themes now, so it'll be a plus. So you do your plot, blah, 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 blah. At the end, you go plus, so then you layer on in theme. Now, so in this case, we're just picking text, which will pick all the text in our diagram. And because it's text, we're gonna use this element text function. And then we can change things like its color, uh, its, uh, its size, uh, whether it's kind of bold or regular or italic. Or we can change the font by going like family culture both of sounds. So this will, this will give it, it'll give it that particular font of whatever we want to use. So we kind of choose it, we can change it that way. Uh, and that kind of that's true. For example, uh, this element part, there are several of these, and we have to match them off with whatever we want to change. So if we were changing text or access text or title text, whatever it might be, use that kind of particular uh, element thingy. If you want to change the panel, the panel's a big rectangle, so you'd use element underscore rectangle um, or element underscore line or whatever it might be, depending on what you want to change, there's the, the, the corresponding element underscore thing that works with that. Uh, if we want to, here we have an example of changing font. So uh, again, we're going to go to use show text and download cabin sketch font. Uh, put in play by using show text auto, make our plot with our panorama penguins and give it some like some text to display. And then we're going to do element text, family that there, change the font size, size 24 and face bold. So you can see that this has changed the text around our diagram to be kind of this particular font. And then if you want to change the legend, the legend is, uh, this part over here on the right hand side to change him. Okay. We're going to go team legend position equals bottom. We don't have to use an element anything for this. So he's gone to the bottom of our diagram. And if we want to get rid of things, so access.text.y, that'll get rid of all the stuff. See the way that on the previous one we had uh, 170, 180, 190. This, that's the uh, Y text on the Y axis. And they're gone right now. The Y title is still there. So separate length millimeters is still there, but the actual numbers have gone. So we can find control over an awful lot of things by, by, by using working with our theme. Um, you can do that for every graphic. If you're, if you're doing like a single graphic, that's kind of fine. If you're doing it, if you're doing a sequence of, of graphics, it's a bit of a pain to have to do the same thing, thing again and again and again for each one. Uh, so what we can do is that ggplot has an overall theme that it's default it's working with. And that's given to you at the very beginning. And you can figure out what that is. If you go to 
ggplot, we can go uh, theme get. Well, tell us what that theme is. And to place an awful, you can see all the different things, strip text dot y dot left. Then we have all those things like what font, font it's in, what face it's in, what color and so on. Uh, all of these, a lot of them aren't set yet. Uh, we can go, for example, uh, at, uh, let me, let's see. I'll do it this way. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna store that actually. So this is theme get at, uh, let's say, panel background, panel grid major, and see what he contains. Nothing. So he's a null. Let's take the panel background. So that panel background, that kind of, the default that ggplot has has got a fill of gray 92. It's whatever, the, the color kind of, it doesn't matter because it's a rectangle, it doesn't have a border. Uh, our size or line type. So it has those kind of features that it contains already. And that's the default for ggplot. But we can change them. We can go theme update. And we're gonna go theme. I don't think I have to do this. I think I just do panel. Uh, maybe I do it to the same. Panel background equals uh, element rect. And we're going to fill equals red. Oh, I didn't like that. Oh, I forgot how to do this. I'm sorry. But you could update your theme this way. And that means that from there onwards, actually, we'll use this app right here. You're doing it with a, with um, with text. So here we set text. We set a family to be, I take a font face, a size, and a color, uh, and the face. Um, and that'll mean that all plots you don't have to call it anymore. All plots there there thereafter will have this particular theme. We'll, we'll put that on top of it, and you don't have to add that text on the end. It'll just automatically assume that's our now our new default. So that's kind of that's what theme update does. Uh, all right, and then uh, another way to do that. So, say if you have that works fine. If you have like one bigger theme you want to, to have in play for all of your plots, and that's great. But it'd be nice to be able to. You know, we we had our theme like black and white, or theme minimal, or theme uh, economist, or theme WSJ. But nice to be able to make our own one, and that's what this does. So this creates, so here we've got, a, again, we kind of add a new font face into our system, did that before. But this theme blue white, we just kind of, we, that's the name we chose ourselves. And it's a function, okay? And it's all these things in it. So uh, you can kind of take this on board and it'll change the, these different elements of it. And it'll create a new theme called theme blue white. And I can't can see the bottom here, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but you knew your plot, and at the very end of this plot, we'll have we'll have plus theme underscore blue white, and that'll kind of take these elements that we put in place, and make that'll be our new theme. And if we want to have some plots which have this theme and some plots which have another theme, we don't have to do theme update. We can just have this. We we made this for ourselves, and we can put that in place. Um, if that makes any sense. So do we could have been getting a new a new theme that we can use. Do you have to? In that kind of function that you've just built there, would you have to specify every different element or every different chart type? No, it'll just change. From, so it begins with the theme basic one, and then it'll kind of it'll it'll change what it, what's specified over here. So if it's not if we don't touch it within our function, um, for example, we don't talk about strip text here, or title text, <coughs> or our, our, our title size here. What do we do? So we don't talk, we don't talk about like you know. Um, the color for the strip, for example, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the, the we don't, 
um, things we do we do we don't include get left at the default. So if you want so to then no, no. otherwise it'd be a very long function. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we can kind of make our make our, our new ones that way. Uh, and then kind of wrapping up here a little bit, uh, we talked about scales before, and I thought it'd be nice to, to mention these at the end. So the scales package is lots of nice little things that, that let us kind of uh, work with in ggplot. We thought about show code already. And there's things, oof, what are we doing? There's things like comma and dollar and label number, SI stands for scientific uh, notation, which is like by, by the tenth of power, whatever it might be, our percent, our pretty breaks. These are all nice things to be able to label our axes. So your X and Y axes and have the numbers going along there um, to have them like in, in a nice kind of, to have them as a nice feel. So scales like as a nice package to work with. And these are the things we put in. You know, if you have our, uh, if you have the scales underscore X underscore log 10 or whatever it might be, we can put them in place at that point uh, and it'll change the nature of our scales. Um, little example of that. So um, we're taking our gap pointer data uh, and we are going to plot, <coughs> we're going to just choose the, choose the Americas. So these are these lines all correspond to a country in the Americas. Uh, and over different years, we have the, the GDP per capita as a function of population. Um, and, yeah, like that. Uh, for example, this is the US right there. Um, this is Brazil, the second highest population. Uh, that brown one is Canada because it's kind of, again, a high GDP, GDP per capita. Third most populous country in the Americas, I presume Mexico right there in blue. And so on down the line. <clears throat> uh, we've made our, if you look at it, we have uh, our wax is kind of, there are lots of countries stuck here at the very bottom. I can remember the conversation we had before about like when to use the, 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 the log scale. So we have lots of countries stuck at the bottom. It's kind of hard to see what's going on with these countries because they're just scrunched at the very bottom of our graph. So to make them come to life, if we use a, a log scale, it kind of tends to curtail the, the, the nature of the, for example, the higher population countries like the US. Um, but it brings out these guys and makes them pop out from the origin a little bit better. So sometimes it could be worthwhile having. But look at the labels there. So it's gone to be a an SI unit, and we're going to have people stuck at the end. So here it has that M right there. It knows enough to figure out that if we have uh, one zero 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 zero, that's a million. So in the previous plot, they had these big, these like these big scientific uh, notation numbers, but now it's replaced them by by capital M. <coughs> if we had countries that had like thousands of people, there'd be a small K there. Or if we had China and India, it might be like 1.5 B for, for billion. So it's kind of pretty smart about doing that and by, by changing the scale to make it more legible. And because it's GDP per capita, it's in dollars. So this guy over here, again, look before and after. Here we have 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. Now we've gone for, again, a log scale uh, and we've had labels equals dollar. So it puts a little dollar sign in front and puts commas in place. Again, kind of making it more legible. And we have a theme minimal. And then we put some other, we can change our theme to have uh, our legend position is at the bottom right now. So all these countries are displayed at the bottom. Uh, we got rid of the legend title because we know these are countries. We don't need to be told that they're countries. And we have gotten rid of the population because we're kind of guessing that one and people stands for 1 million people, and that must be the population of the country. So that's our, that's our final graph. Um, so this has been kind of a fairly, oh yeah, there's, there's one last thing at the end over here. Uh, a question mark about themes. I'm gonna work through, and I think I have, yeah, so I'm gonna let you guys work at them. And I also have, um, give you guys some homework. So a bit like our lunchtime challenge. Um, this is a graph, uh, it'd be nice to produce right there. And 
this is the procedure to go and make it. So either on your local machine or else inside this little box over here, you can work on that. Um, <coughs> it's now kind of half past, half past three. So I thought we might do a little wrap up everybody. Um, I kind of want to say thank you very much for, for coming today. It's, you guys asked some great questions and some great conversation, um, which is like over for an online kind of a conversation, it's kind of hard to get that going, but you guys have been very, very proactive and have been uh, a pleasure to work with today. So I really, I kind of appreciate that you were able to put your hands up and ask questions and, and, and drill, drill into things. Um, it's been kind of very rewarding for me that way. So thank you very much for that. Um, your, your, your time and your help has been very much appreciated and it's been very helpful. Oh, I hope so. And like our, I mean, the goal should be that it'll mean that ggplot is something you pick up in the future. That's kind of, that, that's, that's, you know, if it wasn't before, that should be kind of your default, your, your go-to place for, for, for making pictures. Uh, it is, I gotta say, sometimes frustrating, but for the most part, very, very rewarding. Um, you can, you can bang your head against the wall for an hour trying to get a graphic out, but when it happens, when it does work, um, they can look very nice. And that's kind of, it's very, it's very kind of pleasing that way. Um, so I, I kind of recommend it. And it's a, it's a, for within R kind of, it's, it's hard to go very far with R with before you have to pick up ggplot. Uh, like there aren't that many alternatives. Um, and, and the reason why there aren't alternatives is because it does such a good job. Um, and no matter what domain you're working in, uh, there's always kind of packages that work within ggplot, which are, which should be kind of, which should be for you. Um, do you have any last questions before we kind of, before we bid our farewells? I have two questions, but I don't know if someone wants to go first. No, okay. Uh, yeah, the first one was just a small one, whether the course materials will like remain accessible after this, or is it something that Yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to leave the, the website will stay the way it is. So yes, you can work with that. The, the little exercises as we go through those little shiny apps, um, they might die over time. Like one by one, they might disappear over time because um, like my license only has so many versions of, the, of, of shiny. So as I replace them, the older ones get kicked off. Uh, okay. So they might die kind of piece by piece, but they'll be there for a while. Okay, bro. Um, my second one was a more um, specific question. So I was asked by one of my colleagues to ask you this, actually. Um, and it was on discrete, on a discrete x-axis, whether right. there's an easy way to control the brakes. Um, it might, I don't know if I can share my screen to maybe give you an example. But um, I, can, I can make you do that. Yeah, you should be able to share right now. Uh, where is the button to do that? Ah, shaft right there in the middle. Um, screen one, oh, screen two. Can you let me know when you can see that? Not just yet. Sorry. I'm just checking my spelling here. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, is there any way of producing consort type diagrams in R? What's a consort di type diagram? Um, well, you know, you know, like if you've got um, patients in a randomized controlled trial, um, randomized to different arms, and then you've got a flow chart of what happens to them over time. So you might have a thousand patients in, in the box at the top, going to two, two groups of 500, going to another level with four groups of 250, another level sort of oh, identify people that drop out of trials. Is that a Sankey plot or a river plot, it's also called? Yes, that's what they are. And yeah, the, answer, do those. the answer is yes. And I think there's actually a package called Sankey. All right. Or I'm going to Google that and find out now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's a package called Sankey. How do you spell that? S-A-N-K-E-Y. Or they're called, it's, it's called Gigi Alluvial. Um, 
Can I share my screen for a second? I'll show you what this looks like. Thank you. To see if this is what you're looking for. So it's this kind of thing, an alluvial plot, whereby you here you have, um, uh, this is the Titanic. So these are different class passengers. And first class are um, mostly female and see this, that goes across the, is that right? Or let me, let me look at crew first of all. So the, the crew is like this. The pink signifies male. So most of the most of the crew can go to male. Oh no, that survived. No, I didn't hear you right. Survived. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So the crew most to go to male, and then very few went to female. And then from there, how many were adults? They were all adults. Very few were children. That's probably fancier than I needed, but I'll, I'll take a look. Thank you. Yeah, that's a complex example, but the I've I've definitely seen Sankey done in our. I wonder if they have the code for this someplace. This looks like the code for it. Right there. And your GG alluvial kind of does the does the job, does the heavy lifting. Um, so you need to have a data frame which has just what you have is just categorical variables. So like you have whether whether you can control our 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 our, our subject and the gender and a department. Would this be the kind of thing you would have, Sarah? And then how many how many of each you have in each category? Um not really. I've I've got a cohort of patients who have been um who've got bowel cancer. Who okay. may, may may or may not then have been gene tested, and may or may not then have had a mutation, and may or may not then have been referred to genetics, and may or may not then have, have had a germline mutation. So it's sort of showing okay. the whole cohort, and at what point they all fell out of being being sorted. Okay. So is that like a so you mean as they that's a process they go through, and, and you only get it's a, it's a process they go. Through. Yeah, it's a process they go through. There's about seven steps in it and patients drop out at each step. So it's way, a way of having a single graphic that, sh that sh demonstrates um, which step, which proportion of patients are dropping out. Is that a survival analysis then? Not, no, not really. It, it's, it, it, it's a sort of, it's a service evaluation. Um, oh. And we're, we're missing the opportunity to, to get these patients gene tested through various um, process deficiencies if you like yeah so in, in the world of drug trials that they're referred to as consort diagrams but uh, and it's basically it is just a flow chart i wonder if you do our consort diagram what happens it's consort c-o-n-s-o-r-t Consort diagram. Oh. Well, oh, they got a hit anyway. Yeah. Is it going to show us a finished product someplace? So it looked like this. But that's the sort of thing, yeah. That looks tricky. <laughs> There's a lot of code involved. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, they've done it by hand. They haven't. So these all these geome segments are done by hand. Right. I can't see the purpose of doing that in R, though. Like, that could just be done in Word. What? How does the... It didn't look like that scaled. I, I've, I've, I found a free package online, and I've, um, I've, I've created them using that. But I just thought it'd be nice to keep the whole workflow in, in, in R if you could. I mean, it does mean that, for example, if you change anything, it's kind of easier to, to make the adaptation with an R than elsewhere. Exactly. Uh, that's the same kind of thing. Yeah. 
I mean, you'd, you'd love to, you'd love someone to have like a one code kind of thing that just does everything for you. That, that's what I was wondering because I'd had a bit of a look online and I couldn't find anything, any sort of packages that were dedicated for it. There is, um, hmm, there's a package that does networks called GGRAF. And is that not the kind of thing you want? Uh, I'll just put it in the chat there. That's a, an ex a simple Sankey example. I'll, I'll have a play with them. Yeah, have a go. I think I could sort, I think it could do what you need. Oh, these are like immigration, immigration from the UK kind of thing. Yeah. But it's just a bit more simple than the, the one that was up, that appeared earlier. Yeah, you're dead right. Hmm. So I don't, I don't have a great answer for you. I'm sorry, sorry, Sarah. No worries. Thanks for trying to help. Okay. Um, I'm sure it's out there. And like I say, it might well be more of a net, like a directed network. Uh, might be the thing to look for. Uh, I wouldn't, yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry. Uh, if I come across something, I'll, I'll, I'll touch base with you. Thanks very much. Shall we say our farewells, everybody? Okie dokie. Thank yeah. you for today, Eugene. It's been great. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much, guys. I really, I really enjoyed your company. Um, it's been really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, if you could just take five minutes to complete the evaluation form, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okie dokie. Thank, thank you, you. Thanks a lot. I'll stop. Thank you. Bye. Bye.